you know, the, as far as the department is concerned, the physics department, after taking over by Professor Dinakar, it has become very active. And recently, uh, they started integrated MSc program with the kind cooperation from our beloved director. Director also added many new faculty because they have got a new, you know, with bubbling energy. Many faculty are doing excellent work, especially uh, getting uh, good projects and, uh, you know, being the institute which uh, department which has started along with the inception of the institute so it is doing excellently well and uh, the expectations of the institute uh, can be met uh, from the, the sciences department among the sciences department uh, the physics department is very active and uh, to quote here the department has also uh, contributed towards the development of an equipment related to covid uh, you know in the troubled times yes sir so, I am also happy that uh, one of the, uh, the senior professor who is uh, very closely linked with uh, medical physics uh, has been uh, retiring or superannuating. But uh, I, my close relation way back to early 2000, so, uh, when uh, he was very actively uh, coordinated the ASCII program, uh, managerial skills for uh, engineering faculty. You know, Administrative Staff College of uh, India uh, with cooperation from Dr. Prabhavati Party. I know he has also served the institute in the capacities of uh, the HOD and uh, Dean Student Welfare, the senior member in the Senate. And uh, to tell you frankly, he's a you know very ambitious towards uh, riding uh, new cars. I don't know how many of you agree with me. So. And he's also very good at uh, English communication skills. No, he uh, do not spare that if I talk uh, something wrong, and he will immediately point out that uh, no, that is because he has developed uh, such a good qualities from the very senior faculty existing in the department of uh, physics. So coming to the the one day seminar, of course, uh, though it is one day because in uh, online mode it would be uh, good, and uh, I'm happy to learn that uh, many good. Uh, uh, Eminent scientists are uh, giving lectures in the area for the global warming and so, and the scientists from uh, National Physical Laboratory, they will be sharing the importance, especially Dr. Srivastava would be interacting with you. And uh, I request all the participants and the institutes who have sponsored them to take actively uh, part in the uh, deliberations going in the conference of uh, this particular nature. So, I take this opportunity also to pray God that to wish uh, Professor Lalji Redigaru with a happy and a prosperous uh, retired life. And uh, he is a uh, man of uh, uh, helping nature. So he will immediately come to the rescue that uh, whoever is in, uh, uh, having uh, difficult times. Such a wonderful personality we are seeing. Uh, so anyway, the one day will come in the you know, uh, life of uh, employee. So the day is uh, for uh, today is the day for uh, Professor Elarji Redigaru. Anyway, thank you for giving this opportunity to share my views. Thank you, one and all. Thank you, Amba Professor Garu. Samarpita next. <laughs> thank you, sir. Now I request Doctor. Now I request S. Govardhan Rao, sir, register address the event and say a few words. No. Professor Ramna Rao Garu. Director of our Institute, Honorable Dr. Dinesh Kumar Srivatsa, Komi Baba Chair Professor, National Institute of Advanced Studies, and former Director of Variable Energy Cyclotron Center, Kolkata, Professor G. Amma Prasad Yaru, Dean Faculty Welfare, Professor Dinakar, Head of Physics, Professor L. R. G. Ritigaru, in whose favor, honor, the one day national symposium on recent trends in applied physics is uh, being organized faculty and friends. It's indeed an honor for me to be here as a special invitee. And then uh, I'm particularly thankful to Dr. Dinesh Srivatsava, sir, for accepting our invitation for being uh, here and also to address our people. Uh, many of you may not be knowing that uh, Dr. Dinesh Srivatsava is a doyen in uh, superconducting Linux and also development of cyclotron systems. As a director of VECC has contributed a lot I used to visit VECC Kolkata as a secretary of the expert committee for evaluation of the performance of the center uh, 
for giving the performance incentives and every year when we visit you know there used to be a lot of uh, developments and then improvements and then the dynamic leadership of dr srivatsav was always visible he has been responsible for uh, uh, development of uh, superconducting lanax for electrons and heavy ions development of cyclotron systems advanced to superconducting magnet development and anurib advanced national facility for unstable rare isotope beams then a center for nuclear theory uh, to name a few there are several uh, achievements by dr shivatsav and then uh, i'm really grateful to him that uh, he has accepted our invitation when uh, dr professor denkar asked me to suggest a name in physics who will be uh, suitable for this occasion the first name came to my mind was uh, dr shivatsav and then uh, he has really accepted Yeah. So thank, I'm, you, uh, thank you from my side. Uh, thank you. So I'm uh, least qualified to talk about physics, but let me make an attempt as a earlier uh, uh, science student with the physics. Uh, so uh, Bertrand Russell, in the Conquest of Happiness, he says that of the more highly qualified sections of the community, the happiest in the present day are the men of science. so this is applicable to dr shivatsava professor lalji reddy and all our friends here historically physics has developed through observation of natural phenomena and the derivation of laws which describe these phenomena naturally the profound understanding of the world we live in helps us to survive in it physicists had to always stay alert to see something happening in nature and to record it so they can describe it later the alertness to changes and the passion to discover new phenomena are the fundamental characteristics which make a great physicist physics touches every aspects of our lives it involves the study of matter energy and their interactions as such it is one area of science that cuts across all other subjects other sciences are reliant on the concepts and techniques developed through physics all branches of engineering use the laws of physics to better understand the nature of their own studies as the director has just pointed out society's reliance on technology represents the importance of physics in daily life many aspects of modern society would not have been possible without the important scientific discoveries made in the past these discoveries became the foundation on which current technologies are developed discoveries such as magnetism electricity conductors and other made modern convenience such as uh, computers phones and other business and home technologies possible modern means of transportation such as aircraft telecommunications have drawn people across the world closer together all relying on concepts in physics physics seeks to find alternative solutions to the energy crisis experienced by both first world and the developing nations operating within the limits of system or pursuing the limits of a system is a physicist daily job the optimization of outcomes is a problem more focused by applied physicists or engineers but the theoretical framework for the analysis always comes from the fundamental laws of physics the knowledge of those fundamental laws allows physicists to exercise great control over the creation of new materials and devices which directly affect human life pursuing the boundaries of what we can do thinking out of box is what physicists excel at especially when they face real world problems owing to this uh, out of box thinking the conventional understanding of matter has given way to the existence of anti electronics which were later discovered as particles and became known as the positrons so these are all tremendous developments that have been taking place and then uh, what is in store for a future of physics i think uh, as we have been doing in nit multidisciplinary research is uh, believed to be the way to move forward physics itself is uh, already a multidisciplinary science if you doubt this just consider for a moment biophysics chemical physics mathematical physics and uh, medical physics as uh, professor ram gopal reddy is uh, uh, an expert so physics will always be your friend in solving problems plaguing the world those who are crazy enough to believe they can change the world they will so this is uh, in brief what i understand about the physics and what it can do and i am really happy that we are organizing this uh, symposium today 
and then as others have pointed out professor lrg reddy has contributed immensely to this institute it is a befitting honor uh, that we are organizing this uh, symposium today and i wish him all the best since we have farewell function in the afternoon we will talk in detail in the afternoon thank you very much and once again let me thank uh, professor dinesh shivasawa for gracing this occasion thank you very much thank you sir yes sir people Optica, formerly OSA, the Society Advancing Optics and Photonic Worldwide, is a leader of excellence, delivering high-quality scientific and technical information that is authoritative, accessible, and archived. The new brand, Optica, builds on our history of discovery and innovation. Since 1916, the Society has been the world's leading champion for optics and photonics, uniting and education, educating scientists, engineers, educators, technicians, and business leaders worldwide. Optica currently serves 43,000 uh, customers from 181 countries. Now, I invite today's guest of honor and eminent personality, Professor Dinesh Kumar Srivastava, Homi Bhava Chair Professor at National Institute of Advanced Studies, Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore. Dr. Srivastava has been awarded numerous awards for his outstanding contributions towards teaching, research, and scientific outreach, and he is also nationally and internationally renowned for his more than 100 research papers, talks, seminars, and colloquia. Sir, kindly grace the event and say a few words. <laughs> Sir Dinesh Ji. Hello. Yes. Can you hear me now? Yes, sir. Yes. Please go ahead, sir. Yes. Go ahead, sir. Something happened and I got this. No problem, sir. Go ahead. Yeah, so, dear Professor Ram, Director National Institute of Technology, Warangal. Professor Dinakar, Head Department of Physics, Sri Govardhan Rao, Registrar, uh, Warangal, uh, NIT Warangal, and Professor Ram Gopal Reddy, who is super inviting respect guests, respected teachers, dear students, ladies and gentlemen, a very good morning to you. When I received the call of Professor Dinakar, to speak here, I was surprised indeed as I have never been to Warangal. And then he mentioned the name of our very able, well known, and respected administrator who is a registrar. And I had no hesitation with agreeing to speak. In any case, scientists and professors love to speak. And my wife is telling that if you give a chance to a professor to speak, he speaks for one hour, repeating, explaining, and boring you, so that the applause at the end of his talk is actually an applause of relief. Jokes apart, I know that yours is one of the first, is the first uh, of regional engineering colleges established in India, which has blossomed into national technology, and now a deemed university with courses and research in almost all subjects of relevance for building a prosperous nation and a very well trained youth to take up this challenge. I have seen the profile of your faculty, your very capable and successful alumni, your courses, MOUs with leading centers of learning and industry and what looks like a very vibrant campus life. I'm confident 
that these will continue to scale great heights. I must add that as a child, I was very fond of the children's magazine Chanda Mama, and it always had a story about the Kakatiya Empire. I was very happy when I moved to Bangalore and was hoping to see all these places. Unfortunately, COVID has put a stop to these travels, but uh, it cannot hold us back for too long. And I hope to visit NIT Warangal one day before long and actually see all that. You are just too famous. Thank you once again for giving me this honor. I wish you will be you all the best, especially as we are meeting a few days before Saraswati Puja. Thank you. Thank you, Dinesh sir. Please kindly stand very shortly. Your talk is going to commence. Thank you once again. Really, we are blessed with your presence. And uh, uh, after the Gordana sir has given your name and I browsed your bio data, really, I am surprised uh, to see your bio data. And really, it is a honor and dignity for us uh, to have with you, sir. Thank you. Samarpita. Samarpita. Yes, sir. Next, professor. Thank you, Srivastava. Professor LRG. Now, I request Professor L.R.G. Reddy, sir, to address today's events with his words. Sir, please. Uh, our beloved director, respected Professor N.V. Raman Rao Garu, the most honored chief guest today, Professor Dinesh Kumar Srivastava, and other invitees, and uh, our head, Professor Dinkar, our Professor Amba Prasad Garu, Dean Faculty Welfare, Professor Govardhan Rao Garu, Registrar, and my dear colleagues and my dearest students. I'm very happy that today's symposium is happening to coincide with my superannuation and uh, physics as all our learned speakers have been pointing out has been the foundation for all the sciences especially engineering and uh, the department of physics at NIT Warangal is definitely geared to contribute a lot through multidisciplinary research and especially with the most talented faculty who are committed just not for teaching but research as well or uh, with the department and under the able leadership of professor dinakar the department is making a lot of progress and uh, contributing in varied fields quite diversified fields starting from semiconductors to photonics to applied electronics and uh, I'm really happy and I thank you all for uh, gracing this occasion and thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Professor Ram Gopal Eddy is uh, equal to my brother, even though we are not born to same mother, but from 1984 till today, 40 years, we live like a own brothers. Thank you, Professor Ram Gopal Eddy Garu, for your services. Thank you. Samarpita, next. Thank you, Reddy, sir. It was department's pleasure to have you. Now, I request Associate Professor Dr. D. Haranath, sir, to propose the vote of thanks. Uh, dignitaries who are present online, colleagues from the physics department, colleagues from the other departments, participants of uh, today's one day national symposium, research scholars, dear students, a very good morning to you all. This is a special symposium being organized by Department of Physics as a gesture to Professor L.R. Jiridi, sir, on his superannuation. It gives me immense pleasure to propose the vote of thanks at the end of this inaugural function of one day national symposium on recent trends in applied physics. I'm very much thankful to the chief guest of today's function, our Honorable Director, Professor N.V. Ramnarao Garu, for his support, encouragement, and for gracing the function. Also, we are thankful uh, to special invitees, 
ప్రొఫెసర్ అంబా ప్రసాద్ గారు అండ్ రిజిస్ట్రార్ శ్రీ గోవర్ధన్ రావు గారు ఫర్ దేర్ ఎంకరేజ్మెంట్ అండ్ గ్రేసింగ్ ది ఫంక్షన్ ఐ టేక్ దిస్ ఆపర్చునిటీ టు ఎక్స్ప్రెస్ డీప్ సెన్స్ ఆఫ్ గ్రాటిట్యూడ్ టు ది గెస్ట్ ఆఫ్ ఆనర్స్ డాక్టర్ దినేష్ కుమార్ శ్రీవాస్తవ్జీ హూ ఈస్ హోమి బాబా చైర్ ప్రొఫెసర్ నేషనల్ ఇన్స్టిట్యూట్ ఆఫ్ అడ్వాన్స్ స్టడీస్ ఐఎస్సి బెంగళూర్ డాక్టర్ జి సుమన సీనియర్ ప్రిన్సిపల్ సైంటిస్ట్ సిఎస్ఆర్ నేషనల్ ఫిజికల్ ల్యాబొరేటరీ న్యూ ఢిల్లీ మిస్టర్ మాధవ్ కుమార్ సైంటిస్ట్ ఎఫ్ రీసెర్చ్ సెంటర్ ఇమారత్ హైదరాబాద్ మిస్టర్ రామకృష్ణ రామ సీనియర్ డైరెక్టర్ హెచ్పి బెంగళూర్ ఇన్ స్పైట్ ఆఫ్ దేర్ బిజీ షెడ్యూల్ అండ్ స్పేరింగ్ దేర్ వాల్యుబుల్ టైమ్ టు కమ్ ఓవర్ టు దిస్ సింపోజియం అండ్ అడ్రస్ ది వైబ్రెంట్ గ్యాదరింగ్ అండ్ ఫర్ గ్రేసింగ్ ది ఫంక్షన్ the faculty of uh, physics department and optica uh, student chapter for the financial uh, support i would like to express my sincere thanks to the head of the department professor d dinakar sir chairperson of this event for the, for his continuous support encouragement and he's the man behind this uh, function i'm thankful to the all participants who are attending this symposium i sincerely thank my colleagues and the fellow uh, conveners of this symposium dr saurav roy and dr abdul azim for meticulous planning and execution of this event of this magnitude we are extremely fortunate to be uh, able to draw upon the willing of support of our colleagues research scholars ms students non teaching staff who have uh, demonstrated initiative and involvement at every step and made our task easier thank you one and all over to ms samarpita devnath to start the technical session thank you sir before we proceed further i will request everyone to stand for national anthem brings us to an end of the inaugural function so we'll be getting started with our technical sessions shortly yeah go ahead come up with a good technical session. okay sir we begin with our technical sessions i request dr t venkatappa rao associate professor of physics department to chair the session and introduce our speaker professor dinesh kumar shivastava thank you uh, thank you samarpita and uh, a warm welcome to one day national symposium on uh, recent trends in applied physics um, to commemorate the superannuation of uh, professor uh, l ramgopaladi a senior professor of our uh, department the first session starts with uh, science of uh, uh, 
Science of Global Warming and its Projected Consequences, a talk by Dr. Dinesh Kumar Srivastava. Before uh, the uh, talk starts, uh, let me present a brief introduction about uh, the speaker. Professor Dinesh Kumar Srivastava is Homi Baba Chair, Professor at National Institute of Advanced Studies, Bangalore, since August 2019. He obtained his graduation from Allahabad University in 1970 and joined the training school at Baba Atomic Research Center, Mumbai. He started working at the Variable Energy Cyclotron Project of Baba Atomic Research Center in 1971 and retired as director and distinguished scientist at the Variable Energy Cyclotron Center, Kolkata, in 2016. Later, he continued there as DAE Raja Ramana Fellowship until July 2019. He is a fellow of National Academy of Sciences India and uh, Indian National Science Academy. He was conferred the honorary professorship of the MIT University in 2019. He was awarded Indian Nuclear Society's award, of, award for outstanding contribution to teaching of nuclear sciences. Dr. Srivastava was given outstanding referee award by American Physical Society in 2009. He was also awarded Homi Baba Lecture Lecturer Award by Indian Physics Association and Institute of Physics UK in 2016. Earlier, he delivered Professor Abdus Salam Memorial Lecture at Jamia Media Islamia, New Delhi, Sir C. V. Raman Memorial Award Lecture at Calcutta University, and Madame Curie Memori Memorial Operation or Oration at Chitranjan Cancer Research Institute, Kolkata, and Institute Lectures at IIT Rurki and IIT Indo. He is serving as an editorial board member of Pramana and uh, scientific reports uh, of nature and uh, physics uh, published by MDPA. He was a member of the editorial board of Physical Review C during January 1, 2010 to December 31, 2012. Dr. Srivastava has held visiting positions at several prestigious labs and universities abroad, including Pitt, Kolsha, uh, GSI, Darmstadt, Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, Berkeley, Brookhaven National Laboratory, Upton, New York, University of Minnesota, Duke University, McGill University, University of Cape Town, Belfield University, and University of Frankfurt, etc., of durations varying from three months to two years. He is internationally renowned for his pioneering contributions to the field of electromagnetic properties of quark, gluon, plasma elliptic and triangular flow of thermal photons, elliptic flow of electrons, photon cascade model, relativistic hydrodynamics, production, propagation, and energy loss of charm quarks in QGP, transverse flow, saturation properties of nuclear forces, etc. Professor Srivastava has published more than 170 papers in refereed journals and delivered more than 400 talks, seminars, and colloquia. He is an author of two collections of short stories and more recently, two books of children's literature in science. Earlier, he edited eight books, including a few conference proceedings. His current interests include energy, environment, climate change, and science outreach. His comprehensive monograph on climate change and energy options for a sustainable future, written with Professor V.S. Ramamurthy, was published by World Scientific Publishing Company in 2021. His monograph on art of science of managing public risks with Professor V.S. Ramamurthy and Professor S. Naik is to be published by World Scientific Publishing Company shortly. With this brief introduction, I request Professor Srivastava to deliver his talk. Thank you, Aparagar. Srivastavaji, please kindly start the presentation. Yeah, uh, thank you. Let me first I share it, right? Present now. You have to press that uh, present now, sir. Yeah. Do I uh, then, your, then your screen up here? Entire, entire screen. screen entire screen. Entire screen. Okay. You press that screen and the entire screen. Press that screen yeah, button. I have done that. And press entire screen. I did that thing. Yeah, press enter screen also. Then you uh, go for PPT, sir. 
Yeah, I, I have done that. And uh, PPT should be coming now. Use up arrow, sir. Use up arrow. Up hmm? arrow, then down, sir. Yeah. The bottom, yeah, one up arrow is I there. did that. Yeah. It, it, it is waiting, waiting, waiting. Mm -hmm. So I suppose it is going. Can you see anything? No, sir. No. Hello? Yeah, no, sir. It is not visible, sir. Not visible. Just you have to press the up arrow button present now. Then you have to click your screen and then enter screen. You have to click on the screen also, sir. That your desktop appears. You have to press that one. Then you have to press enter screen. Yeah, it has appeared. Chrome wants to share the contents of your screen. I suppose this one. Sir, if you can share your PPT mail as a wheel present, sir. So that you can go on explaining. See. Just mail me the PPT, sir. Then I will present you. Can. You must grant permission in order to share your screen. Yes, sir. Yes. What happened? You see anything? Not yet. Not yet. Right. First so to present now, sir. Now, that is the thing. This. Then yeah, you press. And then. Press the entire screen. Press the that picture. Left side the one big picture of your screen visible. You press the third one is entire screen. Yes. So I have pressed you. Yeah, yeah, I have done that and now it says share your screen. Uh, Enter. Oh, yeah. Uh, that is the I'm sorry. Sir, just you mail me otherwise. Within two minutes, I will make presentation. If possible, send me the PPT. Yeah, okay. Uh, okay, so I have yeah, I should have done that as a standby. Actually, no the, problem, the PPT file is too long, it will not go. Okay, it should start now. It says that it is sharing our my screen. Yeah. Oh, well, a screen for the photo the Karana was first click karke, then you have to click on share share entire screen. Yeah. Yeah, I have done that. Then you can open the PPT, sir. Yeah, it says that uh, sir, if possible, send a PPT, sir, mail, just to click on the mail. Yeah, the PPT is already open actually. Then you have to open the screen, sir. Now it works so smoothly. Yeah, now it is coming. Now, now it is coming. Now it is coming. Now it is coming. Yeah. Perfect. Now okay. open the PPT, sir. Now we are presenting. Okay. Uh, Abhi PPT ko click karo.
Yes. So mm. open to full box. Open <clears> to full window. <throat> now it is coming, sir. You can go ahead. Oh, niche wo hide button press karo, sir. Stop sharing hide. Hide ko press karo. Oh, niche dekh raha na, sir. Stop sharing hide. Hide ko click karo. Now start, sir. It's visible to us. Dinesh ji. Hello. Sir, it is visible to us. You can start the presentation. Yes, yes, you will start the presentation, sir. It is visible to us. Unmute and start, sir. Unmute and start. Yeah. Yeah, it is visible to us. Yes, but not here, there, sir. Abhi aapka voice nahi aara hai udhar. Sir, it is unmute and speak, sir. Sir, visible. Dinesh ji. Sir, unmute, unmute your mic, sir. Unmute, unmute your mic, sir. Yeah, you press this cup button, sir. You press this cup button, 100 percent, 100 percent. Yeah, 100 percent laga da usko. Or you press this cup button. There is a cup button before this line. One second. Yeah, yeah press that button. button, sir. Press that button. Just to click that button, sir. That cop button. Yeah, it is so. Yes. Just to click that button, yeah. yeah. Once again, it gone, sir. Yeah, some something is very slow here. I yes, don't sir. know why. No, that is slow. Sir, if possible, why can't you send the PPT to me? Just mail me. Two minutes it takes. Yeah, yeah I, I will do that. If it does not work in yeah. one minute. Yeah, no problem. Sir. There may be a uh, slow net connection. Okay, I'm giving up. Can you see it? No, sir, not at all. Oh, here it goes. Okay, I'm, I'm sending it to you. I don't know how it happened. I've mail. given this so many times. No problem, sir. Send a mail to me. I will present. Put the presentation in the internet mail. today is rather slow. No problem, sir. Just you put a mail to me. Yeah, I'm trying to do it. The internet itself is very slow. No problem at all, sir. If, uh, just you go and speak on, I'll present the slides. Please, does it happen? I don't know. Well, that is your kindness. I don't like it. No being problem. Used to being... Because. Uh...
तब तक आप आप ही पी लीजिए है नो प्रॉब्लम सर कोई दिक्कत नहीं मुझे मैं आपका शिष्य हूँ तो मेरा गुरु जी है Yeah. Okay. Let me let me start speaking and yes, we'll yes, parallelly sir. go on working on it. Yeah, because other speakers are there in the queue. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Otherwise, it will get uh, very. Uh, <coughs> I think bandwidth is rather low, most probably. Speaking, sir. just you express your because uh, okay. we are recording this one your voice will be recorded we'll share with others later yeah that's one second and then i will afterwards i'll send you the slides to come ah, yeah yeah i will share with my audience sir please do that one sir. you can share it with the student yeah yeah now your voice is also we are recording sir Only thing is, yeah. So I shall be talking about seeds in energy to yeah. combat uh, global warming. Yeah. And see, global uh, this audience does not know that global warming is devastating us. And uh, oh boy, come on, open this. this. Why it is taking so long? I don't know. I've been opening it day in and day out. Even before coming to you, yeah. So there are signs of global warming everywhere. The temperatures are rising worldwide as greenhouse gases trap more heat in the atmosphere. We are having early springs. And longer. Can you hear me, Professor Dinakar? Professor Dinakar. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You are audible. Sir, you are audible, sir. Your voice is very clear. Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. We are having very frequent droughts and floods, which are becoming more frequent and extreme around the world. We are getting frequent. ferocious and devastating forest fires we are getting tropical storms which are now more severe and frequent due to warmer ocean waters and fishermen tell that all the fish are moving towards north or south away from the tropical regions there is less snow in mountain ranges and polar areas 
and the snow is melting faster. Siberia was hot this year. Glaciers are melting at a faster rate. Sea ice in the Arctic around the North Pole is melting faster with the warmer temperatures. Greenland, Antarctic ice too is also melting. Permafrost, which has not been uh, which has been frozen for centuries in Canada, Siberia, Tibet, etc., is melting and releasing methane, which is also a powerful greenhouse gas into the air. Sea levels are rising and threatening coastal communities and estuarine ecosystems. And coral reefs are dying to rise in acidity. If we look at the share of renewable energies, which are considered to be green, I will uh, come back to it, they are just about 5%. Nuclear energy is 10% at the moment. And rest of the energy, most of it is from coal, oil, and natural gas, all of which release carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. If you look at the world energy share of 2020, the coal is 35%, gas was 25%, hydroelectricity was just 16%, Nuclear was 10%, wind was 6%, and solar was 3%. And all these solar, wind, nuclear, and hydro have to expand <coughs> to make up the entire uh, elimination of coal and gas sources of energy. If you look at the energy generation in India in 2009, the energy from thermal sources has been, uh, uh, in 2019, the energy produced from thermal sources was 75%. From hydroelectricity, it was just 11%. From wind, 5%. And from solar PV, 5, 4%. We produced 1598 terawatt hours of electricity. Yeah, but we need, Actually, if we want to pull our people out of poverty, then we need a factor of four to six of this. The, the rising concentration of carbon dioxide is leading to the rising temperature and climate change. And actually, by now we know that in the last 800,000 years, eight lakh years or so, the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere was never more than 300 ppm. And 2021, it already reached 4 uh, 419 ppm. The temperature over average has been rising and rising. It is already close to 1.1. And if you look at the annual energy electricity use, in kilowatt hour per person, it is very directly related to human development index, which is a measure of prosperity, education, and lifespan. India uses about 1181 kilowatt hours per person. Whereas sustainable and ethical energy usage is about 4,000 kilowatt hour per person. So we actually need to increase our electricity production considerably and make it available to people so that things can improve. The most troublesome thing is that IPCC has declared, has found the IPCC intergovernment panel of uh, climate scientists. And uh, they have found that if the, uh, the average temperature of the, the globe increases by 1.5 degrees centigrade, about 4,000 million people will be affected due to heat wave exposure. About 3,000 million people, 3,000 million people means 300 crore people will have water stress. And uh, 
lots of people will have risk. There will be risk power generation. There will be crop in failure. And there will be habitat de degradation. And these numbers will increase to about 8,000 million people. 800 crore people will face extreme heat with exposure if the temperature goes up to 3 degrees centigrade. And that is the reason we want the temperature to be controlled. There has been projections for global change. And uh, Amazon 1500 was just a forest with very, very vast rivers. It is now being converted into fields. And then all the forests are being cut. The rivers have dried up, become very thin streams. Midwest United States in 1500 had just occasional uh, uh, fields of corn is now growing, uh, mercilessly growing wheat. But in 2500, if the same rate goes on, this will be producing coconuts. It will become so warm that you would be producing coconuts. Indian subcontinent in 1500 was a very rich green field. Today, the areas are becoming more and more uh, dry. And in 2500, perhaps most of India, you will not even be able to, to have agriculture the way we do it today. You may have to have you know, agriculture in the um, inside tents. If you look at the life cycle, cycle carbon dioxide emission in metric ton, uh, then uh, carbon dioxide equivalent per gigawatt hour is about 820 tons from coal, about 48 tons from solar PV, and just about 12 tons from nuclear or wind. And these are the reasons why we say that coal is a very dirty in source of energy, whereas solar PV or uh, nuclear or wind, these are green sources of energy, including hydropower. Okay. So let us examine the sales of green of uh, uh, biomass or biofuel, hydropower, solar power, wind and nuclear energy, and also I will uh, briefly mention hydrogen. So biomass is things like wood, several crops, trees, which can all be converted into biofuel. In the uh, United States, and uh, corn is being converted into biofuel. In Brazil, sugarcane is being uh, converted into uh, biofuel. But people forget that you need to collect, compact, transport biofuel. It is very labor intensive. It is very energy intensive. And when you burn uh, biofuels, you lose all the nutrients. It also releases a lot of carbon dioxide and pollution. You know the stubble uh, burning in uh, Haryana and Punjab is bothers Delhi every year during winter. But personally, I feel that uh, when such a large part of world population is dying of hunger to convert corn and other, uh, other grains into biofuel is not very right. The first hydroelectric power plant in Asia was uh, established in Darjeeling. We have a lot of install capacity, about 1330 gigawatts across the world. And uh, the, the IPCC has suggested that we should double it by 2050. However, the generation capacity right now is just uh, across the world is just about uh, 4306 terawatt hour. India has 50 gigawatts of hydroelectric power plants. Though the projections are that we can easily have 300 gigawatts of 
hydroelectric power plants in the country. But uh, hydroelectric plants are susceptible to droughts. They are, of course, susceptible to season. They can have dam failures. They can cause earthquakes. And what is not normally known is 40 to 80 million people have been displaced since 2000 for making hydroelectric dams. Yeah. They are, they are also uh, subject to tilting and evaporation loss. And when the evaporation takes place in a dam, the water evaporates, leaving behind the salt. And this water goes and becomes more and more saline, which is then used for irrigation. When dams are made, they are normally made in valleys. Yeah, by blocking valleys. A lot of vegetation is submerged. And this vegetation and trees, they, they rot over years and continue to emit methane, which is a very powerful uh, greenhouse gas. Sun does produce a huge amount of energy. Actually, it produces 3.9 into 10 power 26 watts of power. And it will continue to do it for 5 billion years. And it happens because about 4.3 million tons of matter is continuously converted into energy every second. The sunlight uh, source, you people definitely know, at the top of the atmosphere is about 1300 watt per square meter. But uh, the atmosphere itself has dark quite a lot. And at this uh, sea level, uh, on the equator, you get just about 1,000 watts per square meter. But solar energy has a problem. You think that uh, only in clear day, you have power. At noon, you have largest in morning and evening, then you again uh, comes down. And of course, during night, there is no solar power. If there is an overcast sky, it comes down. If there is rain, it comes down. So this is very variable. And this is the biggest problem of solar energy, that it's very variable. But still, it is known that if you look at the solar radiation across the world, a very small area of world can meet the energy requirement of the entire world, which at the moment is about 13 terawatt electric. And it will increase, but then you can increase this, this coverage. The cumulative goal, uh, global solar PV capacity in gigawatts was just about 1.3 gigawatts in 2000. And it has rapidly risen to 773 gigawatts today. And it is expected that in North America, we shall have about 17, 28 gigawatts of power by 2050 from solar power. In Europe, about, about 1,000 gigawatts. Asia will have the largest rise. In 2018, it was just about 300 gigawatts. In 2030, it is about uh, expected to be about 2,000 gigawatts. And in 2050, it should be about 5,000 gigawatts. <coughs> Similarly, there will be more and more solar power installed across the world. But as I said, solar power is intermittent. It is subject to clouds. And what we do not often realize is that if you just take four grams of dust and spread over one square meter of the solar panel, it reduces the efficiency of the solar panel by about 40%. And for cleaning solar panels, you need water. And you also need to keep it cool for higher yields. And the need vast area of land, you need about five acres of land per megawatt. The efficiency of solar panels goes down by 1% every year. 
and you will need to replace them completely in 15 to 20 years. Very soon there will be millions and tons of solar panels every year as the electronic waste and toxic materials like lead and cadmium will be leaching into the government. So you need to have battery or pump up hydro or heat or compressed air or green hydrogen to be able to, be able to store power produced by solar power and make it available and solar PV during the night. Solar panels uh, also use rare materials, which are very material intensive. And the, during the process of making the release harmful chemicals during production. There have been some complaints that as 85% of the energy incident of solar panels is radiated as heat, it leads to deterioration of land and is being reported. The local weather is being affected and land is affected. Moreover, there is another problem. Half of the world's cobalt reserves are in Democratic Republic of Congo. Half of the lithium is just in one country, in Chile, and 75% of our rare earths used in wind turbines or electrical motors are in China. At least in Congo, there have been reports that children as young as four are made to work in cobalt mines. You can also have concentrated solar power plants where uh, this, the sunlight is reflected and concentrated onto a receiver which then heats water or oil, uh, which is then used for uh, generating electricity. And now such plants <coughs> are coming up in Morocco. Also, there is one in uh, Rajasthan, just 100 megawatt. Wind energy is, of course, the cleanest and renewable sources of energy because it has no greenhouse gas emission except at the time of manufacture. Uh, it requires only essential maintenance once in a, and has a lifetime of about 30 to 50 years. It does not occupy space because rotors are at a height of 50 meters or 100 meters. But again, you will need batteries and hydrogen because the, the power produced is very erratic. But global wind generation has been going up as the installation has been going up in 1996, it was just six gigawatts. And by 2019, it is 650 gigawatts across the world. Okay. As I, we already said that it is very extremely uh, intermittent and it is noisy. Actually, you need a lot of space. You need about 20 acres per megawatt. The wind is limited to hilly terrains and ridges. It does not, the entire country of India it does not have a strong winds around the year, only in some times of the year. But you have offshore wind, and there have been complaints that uh, if there is lots of windmills are produced, there can be local warming. It is killing birds, about 5,000. Uh, five lakh bars per year in USA alone. And when the windmills are moving, the they, they cause flickering shadows, which are disturbing people who get epileptic fits and they disturb animals which stop eating. The installation of windmills can be very ex expensive because you have to have 50 to 100 meter long and extremely heavy rotors have to be carried to hilly trains or into oceans, needing construction of sturdy roads or foundations. These are, of course, extremely vulnerable during storms and recycling is in infancy. These are, of course, best with hydrogen batteries or bat batteries just for storing. Nuclear power. Uh, you can have a zero point uh, uranium 235 undergoes fission and then it produces two neutrons which can cause fission in 
net series of uranium-235, and you can have a chain reaction. You can use, you can enrich the natural uranium and use light water as moderator, or you do not enrich and use heavy water as moderator. Nuclear energy is also very concentrated, very strong, because if you just look at uranium fission, in every fission, you generate 200 million electron volts of energy. But you take a, you burn carbon, C plus O2 going to CO2, in one reaction, you just have four electron volts of energy. So because of this, fission produces up to 50 million times more energy per reaction. And of course, it does not produce carbon dioxide. Okay, so that has been, uh, there are about uh, 448 nuclear reactors in uh, 2020, 96 in USA, 58 in France, 50 in China, about 40 in Russia, and about 23 in India, which are operating. France gets most of its energy from nuclear power, about 70%. Russia gets about 20% of its power from uh, nuclear energy. India gets just about 3% or so. But just imagine, during 2020, energy supplied by nuclear power was 2.55 million gigawatt hours, just total 10% of the total energy produced in the world. And in that process, it converted emission of 2 billion metric tons of carbon dioxide. And it has been doing it year after year. A very large number of nuclear reactors are on the way. Asia, China alone is going to build 150 nuclear reactors. India will make another 15, 20 reactors. In Europe, there are about 51 reactors under construction. When in North America, 25 reactors are under construction. And even in Middle East and Africa, 25 uh, reactors are planned. There has been a suggestion to use thorium. And if we can use thorium in nuclear reactors, <coughs> we shall have enough fuel to last us several thousand years. By then, surely we should have fuel power which is unlimited. What is not normally realized, and I wish I were able to show this slide, is that solar power uses huge amount of cement, concrete, steel, and glass compared to uranium, uh, nuclear power. Even hydropower uses huge amount of concrete. Wind also uses huge amount of concrete and uh, steel. So these are the re uh, renewable energy sources like solar PV, hydro, and wind are also very material intensive. One other thing which is not very well known, not very well discussed, is that the solar PV has a capacity factor. Uh, engineering students know what is capacity factor. Capacity factor is that if you have a thousand megawatt uh, power plant, how much power you can get averaged over a year? And for solar PV, it is just about 25%. For wind, just 35%. For hydropower, about 40%. Whereas for nuclear power, you get 94% is the capacity factor. It means that uh, which happens because there is, there is rain or sunshine or day or night, strong wind, the snow, nuclear power just goes on and on. Whereas all these renewable energy sources, they will, they become, they come into trouble. I have already told you about battery because they use scarce material like lithium, for example. And what is not known or uh, talked about often is that you need to use 
about 2.3 million liters of water per ton for extraction of lithium. In the process, you also re release hydrochloric acid in the atmosphere. And that is one reason that in, in Chile, which was producing most of the lithium, there has been change of government. They have a limited cycle. Recycling is expensive. Uh, people do talk about pumped up hydropowers, but these are not uh, possible everywhere. There have been discussions about storing energy as hot scrap metal or even as hot stone. And one source which is being discussed, actually it's not a source, it's hydrogen. And which will pick up, but it is still being developed right now. The, the silicon used in the manufacture of solar panel uses about 1.5 billion liters of fresh water for dust control for a 500 megawatt power plant. And during production, it releases silicon tetrachloride and hydrochloric acid into the environment. It will also need a lot of uh, more water uh, for uh, millions of liters of water annually to wash the panel. And once we start using hydrogen, even the generation as well as for hydrolysis, as well as for use in fuel cells, it will need platinum, which is among the scarest materials on earth with a very finite uh, supply. And people have uh, talked of uh, ideas like uh, getting it from asteroids. Yeah. So, but uh, let's discuss what are sources of uh, hydrogen. One is called black hydrogen, which is from gasification of coal, and gray hydrogen, which is from gasification of, <coughs> uh, which is from city gas, which is methane and carbon dioxide, or you can have blue hydrogen where you use a uh, coal or oil or natural gas and biomass, etc., to produce hydrogen by refarming, but then uh, somehow separate the carbon dioxide and bury it. But this is not considered very safe because carbon dioxide buried in earth, unless it is bond, uh, bonded to rocks, can, uh, can have explosive release. There is even a turquoise hydrogen discussed using the header process for methane, but methane is converted to uh, hydrogen and carbon. Or there is even a molten metal pyrolysis, pyrolysis has been uh, suggested for this. The green hydrogen, as we call it, is uh, it's called green if it, the electricity which you use for hydrolysis is from solar PV or wind or power or nuclear power. And now that uh, there are new design of nuclear reactors which run at very high temperatures, and those high temperature nuclear reactors can be used to produce what is called pink hydrogen using uh, sulfuric acid and, and and iodine. And so there are so, so many sources of hydrogen are being discussed and developed. And uh, it is the source, uh, this is a field of very intense research and development. In all this, the idea of one sun, one world, one grid, proposed by government of India uh, under an international solar alliance of 140 countries of UK, India, United States, Germany, and UK have all joined. And the reason for that is very simple. The sun is always shining brilliantly, and the wind is always blowing strongly somewhere or other. And we have sunshine here in America. It is dark at night, but when it is sunshine in America, we have night here. If we can connect, I mean, we have an interconnected grid. It can be, it can, it can provide power around the clock. 
you have enough water in hydroelectric dams somewhere or other. We can also have placed nuclear power plants at best locations away from human habitation under international safety regulations. So international grid with 30% base load from nuclear power can eliminate intermittency and even a need for batteries for good. It can, we can also provide power to third world countries to rapidly lift them out of poverty and dissuade them from deforestation and use of polluting fuels. The idea of a, uh, in terms of grid was that we discussed way back in 1981 by uh, Buckminster Fuller, who proposed this. And now a lot of work has been done. India has a national grid. China has a national grid. And number of countries have national grids, and you only uh, you only have to connect these grids and connect them to solar power and hydropower and nuclear power to make a very successful international grid. So we do look forward to an era of international collaboration to accelerate development of more efficient solar cells and storage and more efficient turbines. We definitely look forward to fast nuclear technology available, molten salt reactors and small modular reactors that are under development, and a new concept which I did not have time to talk of accelerator sub driven subcritical system and fusion, and international body for research and regulations for nuclear safety. You see, we have very little time left to save our beautiful planet. And this is the only planet in the solar uh, uh, solar system and anywhere that we know so far which harbors life. We don't have any other planet we can live, where we can live. And therefore, it is very important that we protect it and we leave behind a better world for our next generation. Thank you very much. I'm so sorry that I could not show you my slides. But I will send them to Professor Dinaka who can share it with you. So no problem, sir. Your thank is very good. Aparagaro, please. Thank you, Professor Srivasa, for uh, giving a very uh, enlightening talk, talk, talk on uh, non-conventional energy production and their uh, uh, difficulties in uh, making that uh, energy tap to um, I'm so very sorry that this, uh, this thing did not work. No problem, uh, no, sir. Later, later no I will come. Uh, but I will be, but this uh, yeah. very well known, so I will be very happy to answer questions. Yes, sir. Yes, there's one question from my side, sir. Sir, am I audible to you, sir? Yes, yeah, sir. Sure. Yeah, there is one question from my side, sir. I heard a yeah. lot about carbon emission carbon emission government is rewards can you elaborate for one minute about the carbon emission and the government giving the recovery reward something about on that one that is my first question sir. what the government the award, I will not... is one more question sir yeah, but I heard if the temperature increase... yeah one more question sir if the temperature increases by one degree or two degree yeah. integrate from 47 48 water the current one if you are going to the 50 51, I heard that a lot of land is going to submerge in the sea. Please kindly clarify these two questions. Thank you. Yes. Yes, that, uh, that is true. You see, as the temperature is going up, the water, uh, most important thing which happens is that the sea water gets hot. And water as it heats, it expands. That is the primary region for sea level rise. Also, with rising temperature, the ice in Greenland, the ice in uh, Antarctica, the, uh, the, uh, the green, uh, the Antarctica, uh, and in the Arctic, they are all melting. So it has been estimated that if all the ice of Greenland melts the sea level will rise by 10 meters. If all the ice of Antarctica melts, 
the sea level will rise 60 meters. You can immediately imagine if the water level rises by 10 meters or 20 meters, all these uh, coastal areas like Bombay, Chennai, Kerala, Bangladesh, Manhattan, Florida, these will all go underwater. And there is just no way we can avoid it if the water level keeps rising. Another thing happens, uh, and then one can go on and on on this because it's very vastly studied subject, that as the temperature goes up, there is more and more evaporation of water from the, this. And this, uh, so there will be more water in the, in the atmosphere. And if there is more water, when the rains come, they will be very heavy. So the rise in temperature is because of that. Okay. Now carbon dioxide emission. You see, carbon dioxide once it goes, uh, the the most of the air is nitrogen and oxygen. They do not have. They have a very weak. They very weakly absorb infrared light. The sunlight which falls on Earth is radiated. It heats the Earth. And the heat is radiated at infrared rays. But oxygen and nitrogen, they are not good absorbers of uh, infrared rays. But carbon dioxide, methane, and even water vapor, they are greenhouse gases. They absorb and reflect a lot of it back to the earth. That is why it is called greenhouse gas. It raises the temperature. The problem is that carbon dioxide, once it is emptied, it stays in the atmosphere for hundreds or several hundred years. And the carbon dioxide generated from burning of carbon, uh, carbon fuel, coal, etc., has been accumulating over centuries since industrial revolution started. And it has been accumulating in the billions of tons of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And all that is raising the temperature. Now we have to bring down this carbon dioxide. We have to stop emitting carbon dioxide. And the government of India has said that, committed that by 2070, India will not emit, will be a net zero emitter of carbon dioxide, which is that the carbon dioxide which will be emitted will also be absorbed back. It can only be absorbed by plants. Or, okay, only, uh, only uh, plants and trees can absorb it. So yes, government of India is encouraging people in ways and to practice ways where carbon dioxide emission comes down. Thank you. Thank you, sir. We can also award. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Any you. any questions from others? Okay. Audience, anybody? Free to put the question. Yes. Yeah. Okay, that's a very important question. First of all, let us understand why forest fires are caused. Forest fires are caused because of, because of dehydration or droughts, very prolonged droughts, which make these forests very dry. The grass becomes very dry. The, the trees dry up, set their leaves, which all accumulate below. The, and these people are the Australian forest fire, several billion acres of land, millions of acres of land, so not billion, but millions of acres of uh, forest. It is just a fortunate thing that in Australia, the population 
density is very low and forested area is not very good to live. So not people were killed, but in California, every year people are killed and, and the houses are burnt. The only way to avoid this forest fire is to, the permanent solution is to bring down the carbon dioxide and uh, reduce the heating. Otherwise, what they do is to, uh, to make a boundary along the forest and cut down those trees so that the forest cannot be spread. Exactly the same thing as we are doing for COVID, where we don't allow people to transmit. The power fire cannot be transmitted from one place to another place, it will stop. Of course, uh, the other sources are uh, put, putting a lot of water and carbon dioxide, etc. But however, you can do it over a house, but you have uh, 1 million acres of fire raging. How much water pour? How much carbon dioxide you will put? So it is not easy. The only way is to make a large, cut down trees in a large area, belt around the area of the fire. This is how they are handling it. Okay, now sir. I, uh, one last question, no. sir. <laughs> sir, shall I ask one question, sir? Yeah, yeah. Sure. Uh, yes, sir. In present era, people change it from reuse to single use. If, if you take any uh, household article, they change it from reuse to single use. Sir. What is the impact of uh, this single use uh, waste on the environment? Sir? Is there any systematic study on that? Yeah, that is recycling. You have made fantastic. Uh, observation. Actually, the book, the climate change book, uh, which you mentioned, that ends on that. It is the fast fashion or this excessive use or changing models of uh, phones every year, cars every year, which is soaking up all the materials in the world and also using a huge amount of energy. It is finding our greed. But that is a petty so Mahatma Gandhi would have immediately stopped it. But uh, people now are driven by greed, greed and so on. Recycling is the only way. As uh, Professor Dinakar said, recycling is the only way. But people also have to have a change in their attitude. And phones, I have been using a phone, a mobile phone for three, four years, no problem. But people would like to have the latest models. And these days there is another thing called uh, uh, all these equipments like phones and cars. It is now known that companies deliberately put one some parts in it it will tear off, it will go bad very soon and because of which you need to change it. So all these things are what you, some people would call it capitalistic uh, tendencies. But we have been very reckless in spending, in consuming and uh, wasting. This waste is uh, and there is a lot of study in the next book. We do talk about uh, electronic waste, uh, which is being accumulated. And uh, it is a very painful thing that most of the, uh, the rich can transfer the production of all those things which are dirty. The, the, the dirty technologies have all been pushed. India, China, other third world countries, and, uh, the, and uh, they, they, their own countries are remaining very clean. Number of the, the plastic from Europe and America used to be, uh, used to be dumped on India, China, Vietnam, Indonesia. 
now they are waking up but it is too late I mean, already very late plastic recycling is very important and right now we know that plastic is waste is everywhere so this tendency of waste uh, very soon you will have 50 to 60 million tons of uh, solar panels what are do so we have to develop very good recycling technologies and very quickly i hope that answers you yes 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 sir Thank you, Aparagaru. Any more uh, questions? Uh, thank you, sir, for uh, uh, for uh, enlightening answer for my question. Now, our time is. Uh, I apologize once again. No, no sir. No, no, no need to apologize, sir. Uh, uh, Dinesh Vasavji, your presence itself makes us immense happy yeah. because you are such a big authority. You grace the occasion. That is more than sufficient for us, sir. No need to apologize. You are being very kind. kind. No, no, no. We are very small people in front of you. Thank you very much. Samarpita? Samarpita? Yeah. Yes, sir. Please, uh, say thanks to the speaker and go to the next session. Yes, sir. Thank you so much, Professor uh, T. Venkatepa Rao and Professor Dinesh Kumar Srivastava, sir, for delivering very informative talk on science of global warming and its projected consequences. Now, I request Dr. P. A. Azim, Associate Professor of Physics Department, to chair the next session and introduce our speaker, Dr. Gajala Sumana. Sir, please. Am I audible? Yes, sir. Go ahead. Yeah. So, once again, I welcome you all for this uh, session two. So, in this session, Dr. G. Sumana, Senior Principal Scientist in the National Physical Laboratory, New Delhi, she will deliver a talk on fabrication of biosensors for clinical diagnostic application. So before going to, I mean, uh, request her to deliver a talk, I would like to introduce uh, the speaker to the gathering. Uh, good morning, ma'am. Uh, yeah, very good morning. Am I audible? Yeah, yeah. So Dr. G. Sumana, Senior Principal Scientist, CSR National Physical Laboratory. Her areas of expertise are Biomolecular electronics, including biosensors, control release formulation of drugs and pharmaceuticals, liquid crystal polymers, polymer dispersed liquid crystals, synthesis and characterization of polymers. Uh, Dr. Sumana, uh, she is having three patents one US patent and uh, two Indian patents. And under guidance, uh, six students they got their PhD, and now five students are uh, working for their PhD. She has guided 11 students. And she is having uh, nearly 100 publications in various uh, international repeated journals of high impact of factor. And our research, research highlights are research highlight like uh, DNA sensor detects blood cancer, uh, highlighting the publication nano pattern cadmium cellulose Langmuir logget platform for uh, leukemia detection. And one more highlight is polymer paper to detect heart disease, highlighting the publication, applications of conducting the paper for selective detection of troponin. And one more highlight is uh, DNA SNP pesticides. So this is highlighting the improved electrochemical nuclear acid biosensor based on polyaniline, polyvinyl uh, sulfonate. All these are, I mean, published uh, in Nature India. And she has delivered our talks presentation in various uh, nice international platforms like uh, Japan, Taiwan, and uh, in DRDO in India. Now I request the speaker to deliver a talk on fabrication of a biosensor for clinical diagnostic applications. Or to uh, Dr. G. Sumana. Yeah, a very good morning to all of you. So first of all, I would like to thank Dr. Harnath Garo and Dr. Dinakar and uh, Professor Rama Rao for giving this opportunity to print my work. And uh, I, I would like to uh, wish uh, Professor L. Rangopal Reddy also a yeah, very happy retirement life. And yeah, so I'll just share the presentation now.
So hope it is uh, visible. No, madam. Just share the presentation. So shall I uh, shall I start my presentation, please? No, oh, it's not visible, madam. Yeah. So now is it visible, please? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much. Okay. Keep it in presentation mode, madam. Full screen. So yeah, is it okay? now, now, yeah, it is visible now. Yeah. You can start. Thank you. Uh, thank you. So uh, I would like to present the work on fabrication of uh, biosensors of clinical diagnostic applications. So uh, these are the activities which we are carrying out at uh, biomedical metallurgy section at CSR NPL. So we basically we are working on uh, two areas. One area is biomedical metallurgy. And another area is fabrication and design of biosensors for various diseases, like chronic diseases. And uh, basically, we are utilizing various principles of biomedical principles, such as enzyme analyte interactions. Uh, using enzyme analyte interactions, because enzymes are very specific for some analyte detection, like glucose, cholesterol, urea, uric acid, etc. So we are fabricating enzymatic biosensor using uh, specific enzymes. And another area is DNA hybridization biosensors. Here, what we do is we basically use various softwares like primer free software and blast software to design uh, various molecules, various DNA structures for the specific detection of various diseases. And till date, we have uh, designed various sequences for micro, uh, microbacterium tuberculosis, Neisseria gonorrhea, E. coli, and leukemia which we have already uh, like uh, submitted to the uh, gene bank also. And another area is immunosensors. And uh, we are fabricating various immunosensors for the uh, fabrication of sensors for waterborne and foodborne diseases. And recently in 2018, we have uh, started the uh, biomedical metrology also. And in this area, what we are doing is we are calibrate, we are actually, we have established few facilities for the calibration of biomedical equipment, uh, such as uh, defibrillator analyzers and uh, in incubators, infusion pump, etc. And uh, so we are actually disseminating to various biomedical industries and NABL accredited laboratories also. So, uh, and this actually, I would like to take this opportunity to just briefly introduce the areas. And uh, today's presentation, I'll restrict only on biomedical metrology and DNA hybridization biosensors. So, coming to the metrology and calibration of biomedical equipment, I'll just briefly introduce what is the importance and purposes and how what what we are doing because we are being a National Metrological Institute, what is our role and what exactly we are carrying out at CSR NPL. Yeah. So this is the importance why we are doing actually uh, global estimates and statistical estimates indicate that in uh, globally, uh, like worldwide, almost two, uh, uh, like almost two, two lakh to four lakh medical error deaths annually occur at 2.1 million to 4 million medical error deaths annually occur uh, and uh, this this is increasing each and every year and unfortunately it is more than uh, high accidents breast cancer and aids so uh, this is the third most uh, like uh, 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 it is contributing for more deaths even in us so, like uh, uh, when in a developed country like US, if this is the situation, what is the situation in developing countries like India? 
so we have done a lot of statistical estimates and we have done a lot of literature on this and we found that almost 3 million people lose their lives annually due to medical errors in developed countries while it is 16 million in a developing nation so uh, like in india especially uh, people don't uh, question also the regularities hospitals and all this is a very unfortunate uh, you know like situation presently and uh, so uh, this is the third largest killer in us and in india uh, it is actually a lot and lots of uh, cases are coming uh, especially uh, because of the uncalibrated equip medical equipment and and, uh, and med medical errors like fa false positives and false negatives nowadays actually see like uh, uh, even for the covid also we are going for rt pcr why because so other other techniques are like they give a lot of uh, false negative and false positive whereas in biomedical equipment like uh, infusion pumps as well as uh, like defibrillators oxygen oxygen meters and all so that errors are huge and so we need the calibration that is the only way uh, where we can minimize the medical errors so this is the actually statistics and medical equipment failures and uh, so this is a, uh, recently published in WHO journal uh, according to it that 60% of the medical device uh, errors occur due to inadequate maintenance and 20% are due to random failure whereas 20% are due to inappropriate handling. So preventable factors are 80%. So, so we are taking up this activity to, uh, you, you know, like, because to prevent a uh, lot of medical errors. So these are the top te 10 technology hazards for medical device uses. And among uh, top 10 technology hazards, infusion pumps and defibrillators are also there. So we have established a facility uh, to provide standards and traceability in biomedical instrumentation. We have implemented ISO 17025 in our laboratory and we have established the facility for biomedical metrology uh, defibrillator analyzer as per the requirements of IEC 60601. And uh, so how we are doing this, this is the like, this is the uh, calibration facility we have established. And uh, this ability is nothing but when a person suffers from a heart, heart attack, so shock is given in the form of uh, energy. So uh, that shock is, uh, the shock needs to be given uh, by taking, uh, uh, taking uh, so many parameters such as what is the body weight, how much exactly that energy is required and all. Usually, uh, like 150 to 300 joules is required uh, according to the patient uh, condition. So, if we give more energy, for example, if the instrument, instead of giving 200 joules, if, if that instrument is giving 250 to 300 joules, because of the extra shock, the person dies. So, that calibration is very, very important. That's the reason. Uh, but, uh, we have established a facility where each voltage time resistance are uh, like they are linked to the uh, primary uh, that primary uh, SI units because NPL we are maintaining time uh, standard uh, using cesium clock Josephson's voltage standards are there so everything is standardized and we check the instruments whether the instrument is giving the exact energy or is there any deviation is there any uh, like the, uh, 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 that uh, repair is required or uh, exactly that instrument is working properly or not everything we check and give the calibration to enable laboratories and other uh, medical other instruments also so till date we have given uh, the calibration to so many industries such as God rays, uh, uh, that uh, uh, fluke, electronics, etc., and other enable accredited laboratories. Also, this is one activity, and the second activity which we are working on is uh, the fabrication of biosensors. 
in our uh, laboratory we are working on various uh, biosensors such as enzymatic biosensor immunosensor dna biosensor as i have already explained dna biosensor is nothing but actually it is actually uh, the principle behind is dna hybridization immunosensor is antigen antibody interactions and enzymatic sensor is enzyme annulate interactions so for the fabrication of a proper biosensor uh, the main thing is selection of uh, proper uh, biomolecule and the selection of matrix matrix means actually it's actually a chemical uh, thin film uh, where uh, like we uh, where the functional groups uh, some functional groups are to, to the enzymes and analytes and then uh, based on the transcription which we require for example if we are uh, making an electrochemical biosensor we need a receptor in such a way that bio that material itself that it should be conducting or it should have some uh, uh, that uh, optical parameters uh, uh, that and then fluorescent parameters fluorescence piezoelectric so the various transductions uh, uh, various transducers we uh, uh, use electrochemical potentiometry amperometry and optical colorimetry fluorescence reflection piezoelectric surface plasma resonance etc so this is how we do and for the uh, fabrication of uh, uh, sensitive and uh, specific specific biosensor selection of uh, analyte as well as selection of biomaterial and selection of the um, matrix are uh, they play a very crucial role so uh, before design in uh, uh, biosensor for a particular analyte uh, we should we should aim for various characteristics one is selectivity so whether whatever biomolecule we are designing for example dna uh, dna sequence and all whether it is 100% specific for that particular analyte or what is the specificity what is the selectivity whether it is 90% or whether it is giving false negative false positive everything we should actually uh, check and another one is shelf life so shelf life that means actually why we are using different various matrices means uh, it uh, because uh, basically enzymes dna are uh, antibodies if we keep outside uh, at that uh, various temperatures maybe high temperatures high humidity they reduce the shelf life so we protect we encapsulate the material using various matrices so that it should have a shelf life of about 6 uh, months so response time also is very important how fast it is giving the signal and uh, then accuracy uh, so how much it is reproducible and then reusability these parameters uh, we should uh, we should actually uh, give more emphasis on these uh, parameters to uh, design and fabricate a biosensor so uh, uh, in today's presentation i'll uh, give more emphasis on uh, dna hybridization biosensor by giving few example on uh, various biosensor which we have designed in our laboratory such as uh, nisida gonorrhea and uh, ca cancer leukemia especially and e coli Uh, for uh, for leukemia we have actually collaborated with rr uh, army hospital in new delhi uh, where we get uh, clinical samples from there and they test using rt pcr and we test using a biosensor and then we compare and in uh, for the case of nigeria gonorrhea biosensor we are collaborating with all indian institute of medical sciences and for e coli we are doing ourselves because it's just a water borne infection so coming to the uh, importance why we have taken up this uh, gonorrhea biosensor it is the second most common uh, curable sti and as uh, so gonorrhea is a highly treatable uh, 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 sti but uh, if Yeah, and there are 96 million gonococcal infections estimated to occur each year globally, and the uh, reason why we are we have taken up uh, this project and we have done this project for almost six years 
by collaborating with Arlington Institute of Medical Sciences. Why is actually uh, uh, for male it is highly uh, highly uh, easy to uh, get tested using microscope and rt pcr whereas most of the uh, uh, women especially uh, 50 to 80 percent of the large number of women uh, patients are asymptomatic and uh, so they actually uh, this uh, it leads to the infertility and ectopic pregnancy so that's the reason we have taken up this project and uh, this is the actually in microscope microscopy these are the different diagnostic methods used to detect Nigeria gonorrhea one is uh, microscopy second is culture and third is nuclear amplification techniques and fourth is artificial so uh, microscopy uh, for men especially symptomatic men it is highly sensitive 90 to 95 percent and specificity is 95 to 100 percent and culture also gives 100 percent specificity whereas women have lower sensitivity and specificity of only 40 to 60 percent so uh, that's the reason we have designed a selection sequence uh, uh, in opa g uh, then we have fabricated using various matrices and then we have validated the sensor using clinical patient samples this is how we have designed the uh, uh, biosensor. Uh, first of all, we have synthesized various solid supports such as various nanomaterials, conducting polymers, and the various you know thin films have been designed. And then uh, that probe DNA we have uh, basically uh, designed using BLAST and the primary software, and that single stranded DNA has been immobilized using chemical uh, cross-linkers and then uh, so uh, we have used uh, methylene blue as an electrochemical indicator why uh, dna basically if we uh, apply some electrochemical uh, signal then at 0 0.85 0 0.8 volts one in oxidation occurs and then it is not re reusable so that's the reason we have utilized methylene blue oxidation where methylene blue oxidation uh, uh, occurs at two uh, millivolts and which does not uh, decay the guanine oxidation and then it is reproducible. So uh, they, that using guanine oxidation it is not reusable whereas by using electrochemical uh, indicator active indicators these uh, like sensors were found to be reusable. So uh, then initially we have synthesized polyaniline and poly, polyaniline using uh, abidin uh, biotin related DNA. We have uh, covalently linked uh, the uh, uh, DNA sequence and uh, then at various, uh, uh, various DNA concentrations, we have studied the uh, differential pulse voltammetric uh, response studies and we found that it is linearly actually uh, with respect to concentration the signal uh, increases linearly and then we were able to uh, detect uh, various dna concentrations from 10 to the power of minus 6 to 10 to the power of minus 16 mole we have done the specificity studies also using various Nigeria uh, Sikhi, other other uh, like other Nigeria uh, uh, sequences also, as well as other uh, gram-negative bacterial samples also. So various clinical patient samples have been studied, and we found that our sensor was highly specific for Nigeria gonorrhea, uh, especially for female patients. So uh, uh, we have actually studied various uh, various electrodes have been uh, synthesized. For example, polyaniline, polyaniline carbon nanotube composites, zinc oxide uh, nanomaterials, and chitosan uh, composites, and various various matrices have been studied. And we found that the actually uh, uh, like uh, detection range has been increased also from the power of. Um, uh, minus 6 to 10 to the power of minus 16 uh, mole. But uh, after after uh, fabricating the biosensor using gold electrode, we found that this sensor was found to be highly uh, reproducible and we got highly reproducible results and it was stable 
for four months. So then we have actually designed the screen printed electrodes. And uh, then, uh, like various um, male and female patients samples have been taken, and we have tested uh, its uh, uh, like uh, response time and uh, specificity. We found that the sensor, uh, like that, the screen printed electrodes were very very specific and sensitive, and this has been patented. And last year we got a patent also because it is granted, and we have developed the device also for this particular uh, problem. Yeah, so now coming to the leukemia detection. Uh, so uh, uh, we have uh, uh, in, the, in the similar lines, we have also fabricated uh, DNA hybridization biosensors for leukemia detection. Why uh, leukemia has taken was uh, like there are uh, various forms of leukemia. Uh, CML is highly curable and uh, and and uh, if if it is detected early, so that's the reason uh, this particular uh, this particular uh, topic has been uh, taken. And uh, we had a, a joint project with our hospitals, and we have fabricated a, a sensor for cr chronic uh, myelogenous leukemia. Uh, by designing a, a specific sequence from uh, ABL and BCR fusion gene. So we have identified the sequence. And then, uh, uh, but for leukemia, uh, uh, actually that matrix should be highly, highly sensitive. So what we have done is uh, we have, uh, we have uh, fabricated a sensor using quantum dots. And laminar project films where uh, we can get a molecular level alignment. Uh, so, quantum size effects result in unique mechanical, electronic, photonic, and uh, magnetic properties of nanoscale materials. So, the ultra small size of quantum dots provide unique opportunity to immobilize probe molecules in close vicinity to a transducer surface, thereby facilitating electron transfer. So uh, we have done uh, uh, electrophoretic deposition of quantum dot status and composites, and quantum dots based LB films have been uh, designed and fabricated. And then we have uh, formula. We have actually designed a matrix uh, where uh, it can detect uh, CML uh, very specifically. What is EPD in electrophoretic deposition? Charged molecules dispersed as suspended in a liquid molecule are attracted and, and deposited onto a conductive substrate of opposite charge and application of a DC electric field. So it offers an easy control of the thickness and morphology of the deposited film through the simple adjustment of the deposition time and applied potential. So we have uh, designed a Hyperson and TGA cat uh, quantum dots and then uh, then we have uh, fabricated a sensor by immobilizing uh, a single stranded DNA onto it. And we found that, uh, that it is actually uh, able, to de able to detect uh, DNA, target DNA concentration of 10 to the power of minus 6 to 10 to the power of minus 11 mole with limit of detection of 10 to the power of minus 11 mole. And we have done the uh, sensing studies using complementary DNA. CML positive samples, CML negative samples also. So we found that it is highly specific and it is able to detect CML positive samples and differentiate the CML negative samples also. So uh, to enhance the sensitivity, uh, we have uh, form formulated langmuir blodgett films also. Uh, in langmuir blodgett films, uh, the precise control of the monolayer thickness and packing is uh, can be uh, easily attained. We have uh, deposited eight monolayers of uh, quantum dots onto the ITO coated uh, glass substrates and then we, we have fabricated a sensor using uh, uh, that uh, designed uh, uh, designed probe DNA, and then we found that uh, we could be able to enhance the sensitivity from 10 to the power of minus 6 to 10 to the power of minus 14 linearity we have observed, and then the limit of detection has been increased in earlier. Uh, 
uh, yeah, using electrophoretic deposition, we could reach the limit of detection only up to 10 to the power of minus 11 uh, mole. Whereas in this case, we could be able to detect 10 to the power of minus 14 mole. That is, we are able to detect uh, the cancer at this same as. CML positive sample at a very early stage. So these are the these are the results that uh, uh, we have uh, even compared with uh, various RT PCR uh, uh, results also that we have found that it is able to differentiate CML negative patient samples at a very early stage where only RT PCR is able to detect, not other. So uh, this is the conclusions that uh, we have designed a CML specific probe DNA identified uh, from PCR ABL gene has been designed using nucleotide blast and we have deposited uh, different thin films based on quantum dots and composites have been carried out using various deposition techniques that is LB self-assembly and electrophoretic deposition technique. The application of quantum dots based nucleic acid sensor resulted in the wide detection range with lower detection limit up to 10, 10, uh, 10 centimol and selectivity towards detection of CML and they were found to be usable for about 6 to 8 times when stored at 4 degrees centigrade uh, and the uh, stability was found to be 4 months and specific city studies have also been carried out using synthetic oligonucleotide sequences and validated by clinical samples of both CML positive and negative patients. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah. Jim, thank you, thank you very, very much, madam, for excellent uh, talk on this uh, biosensors. Madam, is it possible to use uh, this this type of sensors to detect uh, the corona or COVID 19? What are you talking about now? Uh, no, no, no. Actually, uh, for COVID 19, uh, there, is, uh, uh, there is no change in the genome. Okay. So, uh, if, if at all there is a change in the genome, for example, in cancer, uh, like the genomic changes are happening and they are huge, whereas for some uh, viral infections and all, that's the only solution. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Now, I request the audience to respond. If you have any yeah, questions. one general question I would like to ask, sir. One general question, madam. Yes, yes. Nowadays, we are seeing several gadgets, madam, like uh, Apple Watch and some other watches, where they are using some sort of uh, biosensors or some center, where they are measuring the blood pressure or BP or heart rate, something. Are really worth believing, madam? That is my question. In market, several distortions are there, including Apple Watch. Yeah, but the calibration also is needed, sir. Maybe like at the manufacturing site, maybe it is okay. But wear and like wear and tear also is there in yes, especially yes. gadgets but, and all. To what extent they are reliable, the madam? Correct result for that calibration is required. So yeah, even system. even if the very new brand I am buying, uh, for example, I am using for six months, is it just to some extent reliable? That is my question. Calibration we can do after use of one or two years. One year, yeah, I think it is really reliable only, sir. Okay. okay. Okay, thank you. Ajim sir, Paul sir. Yeah, Paul sir, you can ask your doubt. Ask the question. Thank you, sir. Uh, am I audible, madam? Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, madam, this is a very good talk and a very interesting one to me. Uh, madam, you told that there are some materials which we can use, like zinc oxide, cerium oxide, yes, and. Uh, we have used, yeah, we have used yeah. zinc oxide. And actually, zinc oxide, cerium oxide can be used. But one disadvantage is. Uh, immobilization like uh, immobilization techniques are there uh, so if we do covalent immobilization chemically then the stability is more where there is no chemical interaction only some molecular interactions are there between biomolecule 
and uh, matrix then uh, like though this this show good response steady and all stability is an issue so for the for getting the stable biosensor it is always advisable uh, to uh, chemically link the biomolecule onto the matrix madam is there any specific requirement like uh, conductivity or uh, surface functionalization for this on the transduction if we are going for uh, for example optical biosensor only color change is required then in that case conductivity is not required so what type of transduction mechanism you are using if 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 at all we are using a fluorescence transduction that material should have fluorescence if if we are using the electrochemical uh, if we are making electrochemical transduction the material should be conducting okay so for example if we are like going only for optical biosensor uh, colorimetry like just like ph uh, uh, that uh, uh, sensor and all so in that case uh, conductivity is not required only thing is uh, uh, like yeah so it, it should have some material uh, some color uh, material which give, which which gives response to that particular analyte and uh, whatever uh, uh, side product comes for example enzyme analyte if they interact h2o2 releases so that whatever sensor we are making it should it should it should change the color as per the concentration of uh, the product okay madam one more clarification madam are these are uh, free standing powders or uh, thin films madam no sir they are they are all thin films and we have fabricated various sensors on uh, screen printed electrodes as well as paper electrodes okay okay thank you madam thank you okay any other doubt any other clarification required from audience good good morning madam yes uh, ma'am actually i have doubt actually biosensor if uh, reusability of a biosensor actually once madam biosensor we can use then after that if you use then it actually don't so actually good result actually so how it can avoid actually this thing no uh, so depending on like uh, depending on uh, the cost analysis and all we can uh, we can fabricate reusable biosensor and disposable biosensor both are possible yeah i'm not getting your question can you please repeat ma'am the basic point is i think is uh, is it label free um, detection or means there will be label if we use it once again so uh, actually you know depending on your final requirement we can go for label free or we, if we use label then, then cost will be reduced if we have, have to go for label free then cost will be high so there are lot of lot of opportunities in designing so both are possible actually and so for ma'am One by one, one by one. Hello, ma'am. Actually, in uh, in your slides, sir, ma'am, you written culture in gold standard. That thing can you explain? Which one? Uh, one thing you can written the microscope after after yeah, that. Yeah, culture, written... culture. Basically, uh, in laboratories, the culture. You know, the culture bacterial sample. And in clinics, they say that it's a gold standard. it's nothing to do with the biosensor i just compared with the traditional techniques that how sensitive our biosensor is in response to the uh, already existing technologies such as microscopy culture and rt pcr so rt pcr and culture they are considered as gold standards in the clinical practices thank you madam any other doubt Any other question from the audience? Okay, sir. Let us yeah. go. If no more questions are there, I would like the speaker, Dr. Ji Sumana, for the excellent talk on uh, application of biosensors for uh, clinical diagnostic application. Thank you, madam. Thank you very much for the. Thank you, thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And thank you, Sumana. Thank you, Samar Pita. Samar Pita. Yeah, thank you for giving the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Samar Pita, are you there? Yes, sir. Go ahead. 
Thank you so much, Professor P. Azim and Dr. Gajala Sundana, ma'am, for wonderful scientific talk on fabrication of biosensors for clinical diagnostic applications. Now, I request Dr. Saurav Roy, Associate Professor of Physics Department, to share the next session and introduce our speaker, Mr. Pradeep Kumar Dixena. Sir, please. Hello. Am I audible? Hello, good, uh, good afternoon, everyone. So I am Pradeep Kumar Dixena. So actually, this session was uh, given by Mr. Madhav Kumar, sir. But uh, due to this uh, COVID, he is a little bit uh, problem is there. So he asked me to just take the this one. So on behalf of him, I like to thanks to NIT Warangal professors to give the invitation. And uh, thank you for uh, this opportunity to give the presentation for the uh, our work area. So we can present uh, the uh, type of work we are doing in field of uh, RFIC design. So that I would I would like to present in this uh, session. So first of all, uh, very, uh, very good afternoon to all the dignitaries of from uh, NIT Warangal and uh, other uh, professors, and also the. Also, all the participants. So, shall I start uh, uh, my presentation? Please, here? please, sir. Share your screen. Presentation. Yeah, you press this arrow, sir. I think you are aware of this one. Komalu, me, sir, this one. Yeah. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes. Yeah, it's perfectly right. Yeah, okay, sir. Go ahead. So, okay, sir. Then, uh, shall I start, sir? Yes. Hello. Yeah. So this basically now I'm going to do talk on this CMOS by CMOS RFIC design, basically a perspective. So what in the field of the CMOS by CMOS and in the RDO, what kind of work we are going on? That's why I want to give a little brief on that. So the, the presentation outline of basically basically to give the motivation for this RFIC design and why this kind of field is required and what kind of challenges are involved on that. Then uh, basically, since this is mostly related to physics, so mostly the, all this are derived from the physics. So the CMOS technology and modeling. So uh, basically, they are kind of engineers. So we take on all the input from the physics background and we start doing applying this physics for our work perspective. So that's how the CMOS technology and modeling can be done and all things. And what kind of architecture for this RFIC? Then. Uh, I'll give some brief insight into the circuit design, then some example design, what we are currently working and what kind of uh, applications are there that I will explain. Then we'll go to the conclusion. Anytime, if you require any question or something, you can stop me in between and uh, give me a Okay, okay, sir. Go ahead. So let's uh, the first go to motivation. What is this? Uh, uh, you people are uh, hearing about SOCs and RF SOC. So basically, if you see any kind of systems law right now, what are the CPUs and servers? All this consists mostly kind of a S uh, SO, uh, 
kind of systems which are having like a digital system processing or kind of processor now things becoming advanced so what is happening now a lot of systems on chips are coming what is happening so the like processor along with some peripherals they are integrating in a single chip so that's their uh, people calling it that is a soc the system on chip so that's why the you are seeing the things have become very compact and all this uh, the sizes are uh, less so in a single chip a lot of functionality has been integrated then after that one more new thing is come like rf soc now what is happening there will be one if you go for any kind of like mobile or something so there will be one system which are uh, handling this uh, processing and other uh, other chip which are handling this uh, rf and all this thing so now people what they are doing they are integrating this uh, rf processing along with the digital signal processing in a single chip that's they calling the rf soc so mostly what are the system like a vimax 5g or any kind of a high frequency so that kind of systems which are working in the gigahertz range they generally we call it rf so when we integrate this rf signal along with our digital signal processing then this is called as a rf soc so the basic uh, if we can like, try to explain this basic basically what will happen the front end basically can consist of some kind of uh, a very high frequency uh, interface which will consist mostly along started with antenna then there will be some switches then power amplifier then high frequency signals like uh, then we'll process with some front end amplifiers then there will be a, a down converter or mixer which will convert this high frequency signal to the low frequency then it will be processed in the base band Baseband basically, so high frequency and baseband differences. High frequency, suppose if we are talking in some gigahertz, like some 10 gigahertz signal, 20 gigahertz, they are called as RF. But when we come to the megahertz range, then will become baseband kind of thing. So the the processing we call it baseband processing. Then this uh, baseband signal is given to the processor, and that will give all this kind of uh, information of application layer and everything will be in there, and which will post process the data. So the front end, what we are seeing here, this is kind of RF SOC, which will integrate all the system in a single chip. So this is basically kind of RM, RF system integration. So what is the advantage of this integration? First, basically the cost. So what happens as we as, as we increase the complexity and integrity in a single thing, the cost will start reducing because in a single item you can get a lot of functionality. And which will uh, which will give more cost advantage. So basically, the advantage of assembly also in the packaging. Second is the power. So just so what happens if we, we integrate multiple system in multiple chip in a suppose let's we take one PCB and we integrate multiple chips. So then in between we require a lot of coupling decoupling capacitors along with some kind of parasitic. So what happens when the signal flow from one chip to other chip? There will be parasitic has to be driven. And this parasitic will take a lot of power. So when we start integrating this uh, multiple chip in a single chip, then what happens? Uh, the in between the parasitic, the driving this parasitic will be less power required. So the slowly the power will reduce, and uh, so that will give the power advantage. And third thing is the design flexibility. So what happens? Uh, the signal stay on chip. Basically, uh, if we integrate uh, off. Of the cell component, the signal go out from the one chip and then again go to the other chip. Then the signals are vulnerable due to the external words. But suppose the signal flow is inside the chip, so the, the interface from the external world will be very less and it will be kind of less noisy. So that will provide one kind of a design flexibility and also will give the less noisy signal. So it required less kind, less this complex system to handle. Hello, now it is okay. okay. Uh, so now it is okay. Yeah, it's fine, sir. It's fine. Okay, then. Uh, so other advantage of this integration in your size, you know, the other thing is reliability. Why the reliability is better because. Uh, since we are now handling less number of components earlier suppose if you go for multi pcb we are having multiple capacitor register along with multiple chips so then each system reliability will affect the your system, overall system reliability but suppose everything you integrated in a single chip then what will happen the reliability will depend decided by the one single component 
So if that component is reliable, then the whole system can be more reliable. So that will increase your reliability, then tolerance. So tolerance basically affect uh, what kind of uh, uh, what kind of margins we are giving and all these things that also will improve a lot with integration. If CMOS can do it really properly, so proprietary technologies understand unless there is a substantial performance advantage. So basically the people, so what is the now trend is a, whatever thing can be done with CMOS, let's uh, handle it in CMOS. If not possible, then only due to the other kind of subsystems. So that is the uh, now trend, trend is there. So now basically, we're calling us a CMOS, but there are two types of technology basically. One is a silicon technology, and one is a, this is a gas technology. So, what is this gas? That is basically gallium arsenide. It's a kind of semiconductor which is made by using this gallium and arsenide kind of uh, material. Another is a less silicon, which is a, another kind of a, a semiconductor. So, uh, what is the advantage of gas? Basically, the gas is basically having high electron mobility so basically that will give the advantage in uh, terms of high frequency operation <clears throat> so and they also the advantage of uh, this gas is that having an intrinsic gas is a semi insulating basically so what happened when we create this uh, any device using gas that will provide good insulating uh, material so well suited for the use of a substrate but for a strip line and passive, that will also provide very high Q. But uh, the disadvantage is having very large band gap. So it will require very high voltage for operation. But, but this high voltage operation having an advantage, we can generate high power through that. So if we go for any high power kind of operation, suppose uh, like mostly for kind of a power amplifiers, where the or which is directly going to the antenna, where required the power is high. So then this gas kind of devices will be used. And also, the advantage of gas is this is a basically radiation hardened. So whatever the this radiation uh, effects, that will be less compared to the silicon. But uh, why people moving more to the silicon? The advantage of silicon is they have a small channel length. So with that, we can get hunting speed. And also, they have low VT. So uh, compared to the gas, it has low VT. So it has a uh, low power circuit we can design with this. And also, they have multi-layer backend, high integration. So another advantage of silicon that we can go high level of integration in this silicon. Gas, the level of integration will be very less compared to the silicon. So silicon, we can we can integrate something thousand or ten thousand kind of gates in a single chip. So that is the advantage we can get in silicon. But that kind of gate integration, all these things, not possible in gallium arsenide. And also the now the wafer size. So why this wafer size is important? Because the wafer size decide how many chips or how many transistors you can fabricate in a single go. So so as the wafer size increase, the yield will be more because the percentage of uh, getting good uh, devices will be more compared to the for small wafer size. So then that will reduce the cost overall. And also there is another uh, in silicon. There is one one. New thing. So what people have integrated along with silicon, they are integrating germanium in a same substrate. So they call it CG technology. So that will provide high frequency operation. Okay. So let's. Uh, what are the challenges in this analog and RFIC design? So basically, uh, if you see the circuit design uh, in electron in a Chip design point of view, it is segregated in two things. One is the analog RFIC and second is a digital. So in a digital only we have to see mostly like this noise margin and the power levels and switching speeds. That is the major concern. But in, if you go, come in the analog and RFIC, so this, this is, we call it some octagonals where uh, there this kind of uh, parameter we have to handle simultaneously for operating any circuit in a proper range. So this, these are the, the challenges are noise, linearity, gain, what are the supply voltage, voltage swing, speed, impedance, and power dissipation. So these are the uh, octagonal. So for any circuit design, we have to take care of all these parameters at a time to make sure the what are the performance requirement that is meeting for the circuit. So that are the challenges for the for this analog and RFIC design. So basically in the RFIC design, so basically the people who are involved in this RFIC design, they have to understand all this uh, particular challenge. Basically, the RFIC mostly consider this uh, communication theory, random signal, 
microwave theory signal propagation and what kind of access wireless standards along with ic design and cat tools so these are the challenges for so the rf design is basically kind of multidisciplinary design where the people has to understand all this uh, domain and they should have knowledge on especially any design thing circuit so what are the advanced rf cmos process so they basically if you see the rs cmos process so the left side what i am doing is a basically kind of a fabrication technology where the now the you see the transistor level a lot of integration has happened so multiple metal layers along with the transistors and everything now it's coming in a very precise and very small substrate we are able to do all this kind of integration so basically they uh, in the top level if we go for any rf ic design mostly we require this kind of a component like inductors and capacitors so what people are doing in silicon they have used this high the top metal layer the thick metal layer about the tm inductors there we use as a inductor and try to fabricate as a inductor get the high q density and along with that uh, we have to fabricate this precision resistors and uh, capacitors for the rf operations so other things are required is that a high power amplifier transistor basically they should sustain the very high voltage so that also has to be taken care in the its fabrication process so rf transistor so any of transistors are same but in the rf and uh, simple transistor there is a difference basically in the simple transistor they simply do the parasitic modeling of simple rncs but what happen in rf transistor they have to model the even the surrounding also because the small metal also will act as inductor so that has to be modeled properly so that's why the design is different little bit in the simple analog circuit and the rf circuit then the transistors so what type of transistor has to be used for the rf design is basically uh, this is jfet and bzt so jfet uh, jfet is simple kind of mosfet kind of thing but bzt is a uh, earlier people used to bzt in form of a discrete component now this bzt also has been integrated in kind of a silicon uh, substrate so now people using this uh, bzt transistor for the rf design and also there is a one technology called well what is a well basically well well basically that will isolate between the different kind of transistor like suppose i am fabricating uh, nmos or pmos so they have been oscillated between the transistor so that has been isolation has been done by this well so generally to compose this rf technology what they are doing there some triple well or deep envelope technology they are using for isolating these transistors and also after that the substrate the substrate for the particular rf the requirement is it should be very highly resistive so there should be no leakage or no coupling should happen from the outside circuit so these are the process which is required to integrate uh, this rf technology in a cmos process so basically the advancement of what happened in the rf cmos performance how it had a, how this rf circuit came into the inside the cmos so what are the uh, advancement has been done that basically one is the scaling so as you heard that uh, this uh, silicon technologies are scaling and uh, now we are giving going up to 7 nanometer technology so so that is given advantage for the this rf uh, rf people also because uh, they rf people the mostly important factors are this ft noise q factor and so on so that is required so rf devices basically what kind of logic transistors has to be used like uh, adc dac are very high frequency so basically the key device characteristic which defining all this uh, characteristic of the transistor is like a id set id linear vt and i op so these are basically kind of current uh, parameter which is required in the technology and for analog transistors basically the uh, the which is required which is important is a gm <coughs> gm basically the transconductance impedance matching linearity and all these things required when you go for this rf transistor <coughs> basically which consists of this power amplifier mixer or trans receive switches are like a lna so the important factors which required we define the transistor parameters we required is a 
f t f max one by f noise and f minimum. So that parameter required for this or have transistor design. Then if suppose we go for this power amplifier transistors. So what have, what is the requirement here is basically the f t f max and efficiency. So these are the parameter which we expect from the technology to provide uh, this uh, parameter good uh, these parameters so that can this kind of transistor can be designed. So suppose if want to go the to want to design the PLL on inside the chip, so then with that type we require very good C, very good Q circuit and matching along with capacitors. So these are the parameters we we we, we want to see from the technology point of view. So that can be help us per our design. Okay, this I told the scaling. So basically, what the scaling means actually, suppose uh, the left side, what I what, what is showing is a one kind of transistor, how it is fabricated. So basically, there will be one gate. The gate is basically defined by this polysilicon. Then there will be one oxide layer. And then both sides, there will be one uh, substrate. One will define as a source, one will define as a drain. So now this the diff, the space between this source and drain, that is it is uh, reducing so basically once they, they start reducing this then they will get a bit less channel length so the speed will start increasing so this we call it as a scaling so now what, after the scaling also the people are doing a lot of innovation on that they are putting some high k metal gate some strand silicon so this gate can be very precisely controlled so that with that this kind of control and this kind of technology now with uh, they are able to fabricate till 45 nanometer 32 nanometer and now they came till to the 7 nanometer also so there will be control through the gate this channel can be controlled so this also helping in the terms of uh, speed and uh, density so in the same same area we can fabricate multiple transistors with a very high speed so that is the advantage of this CMOS fabrication and uh, scaling so for rf the most important factor is this ft ft is what we call this a uh, frequency at which we can get a uh, current gain at what we define as a frequency we call it a ft so what happened when the technology scaling is happening the slowly FT parameters are improving. So if we see that C18 nanometer or point uh, 350 nanometer, the only FT is around 50 gigahertz. But when the when the transistor starts scaling, and uh, it, when it reaches to 28 nanometer, the FT has gone up to 350 gigahertz. So what does this uh, uh, signifies that as the scaling is happening, the transition frequency, our means frequency at which we can get the current gain or uh, kind of voltage gain, is the is uh, up to 350 gigahertz so our circuit can operate at this frequency at 50 gigahertz kind of thing so that gives the boost on the rf uh, designs and all so that is the that's why now people start integrating more the rf transistor in a cmos technology earlier since uh, this kind of frequency is not possible that's why people are using discrete component but due to this improvement of ft only the people start thinking and integrating the RF in a CMOS technology. So as I, I told earlier, there is a one by CMOS technology or silicon CG technology, but uh, instead, uh, along with CMOS, now people are also fabricating BJT in the same substrate. So we can get the advantage of BJT also. You see that they're only changing a little bit of the fabrication in such a way that uh, this uh, BJT can be also fabricated along with the CMOS. The left side is showing in the fabrication of CMOS where we have created NBEL and PML for the CMOS and uh, NMOS kind of transistor. But in uh, BJT, there will be kind of deep NBEL where one N plus will be fabricated. So basically, this is kind of NPN transistor. And also, there will be one silicon germanium kind of substrate has to be used that will be used as a base. And uh, then there will be one emitter connection for taking from the top. So then this is creating one uh, silicon germanium uh, NPN transistor heterojunction. Advantage of silicon germanium that so we will get more because germanium having high mobility compared to the silicon. 
so the speed will increase through this silicon germanium so the through that silicon germanium we are able to achieve the higher speed along with the uh, this is getter integration in the cmos so for equal performance silicon germanium offer higher breakdown voltage and higher gm by gm gm per microvistor and low 1 by f noise and also this thing have since uh, this 1 by f noise came from this uh, silicon dioxide interface so instead of that here we are using a silicon germanium uh, interface so which will reduce our 1 by f noise so that is another advantage of this by cmos silicon germanium technology which will be again again helpful for this rf design and another uh, new new things what is happening in this rf uh, integration now people are able to fabricate this different kind of uh, co planar guides mostly if you say, see that uh, now this for rf frequency we used to design this transmission line so different kind of uh, transmission line is now possible in the in this rf new rf technologies where we can uh, easily fabricate this uh, 90 degree or 45 degree bend also is possible for different kind of application along with the coplanar waveguide transmission line that also can be done through this technologies so now they, this kind of uh, libraries they, the fab is going to is going to given is going to providing so we can integrate as much possible as possible in the our design so that is in terms of technology now i'll just show the architecture uh, there is two basically purpose one is uh, mostly rf people are looking for the either for communication or some kind of radar so uh, in for our drdo application mostly these two applications are more important either for communication or some radar applications so in communication mostly now this different kind of architectures uh, are there like a super heterodyne receiver where what we do uh, first uh, rf will converted to some if frequency then from if it will go to the baseband frequency so they we call this a super heterodyne architecture so but the problem with the super heterodyne architecture is basically the image problem what happen in this if uh, what happen one more uh, it will convert the higher frequency also uh, same band so that will come in the same band and which will cause the interference in the signal so the mostly for this rf ic design people are using this direct conversion architecture so that instead of directly going to the if they will directly come to the baseband so whatever the our rf input frequency we set our mixer frequency at the same frequency hello will be in same frequency so the so the rf is a omega rf and w omega l so after down conversion the directly it will come to the baseband as well so and then there will be no image problems so this will be the better architecture for the rfic integration compared to the super heterodyne but the problem with the direct conversion architectures there are multiple challenges and solutions are there first basically the problem is the lo leakage from lo to rf which is called dc offset so what happens suppose we convert directly from uh, rf to lo then what happen this lo can couple to the for mixer and it will give an another component so that has to be cancelled so that's why we have to do dc offset cancellation using this ac coupling or some bypass filtering then another problem for cmos technology is flicker noise what happen in the cmos there will be a, at low frequency there will be high low frequency noises are more compared to the high frequency in the super heterodyne since we are coming to the if so that low frequency component will not come in picture but in a direct conversion architecture this frequencies are coming coming again in the picture so that we have to isolate it and we have to design circuits such that this flicker noise component has to be removed so what uh, the option is that uh, instead of using cmos people are using this bjt kind of architecture so that uh, flicker noise component will be less second is this iq component iq amplitude and phase mismatch so mostly now this direct conversion architecture we use i and q in phase and quadrature phase kind of mixing so that this matching is required between these two if there is mismatch which will give the information wrong information will be processed to the next circuit so that has to be avoided and also there some different kind of distortions will happen so that also has to be solved inside the chip so this is the one what we done in the anurag so basically the we have integrated one rf front end expand the receiver this we designed for this satellite communication 
so here also we followed this uh, direct conversion architecture so what we have done here uh, the our input density is a range of 2.5 giga to 2.6 gigahertz and uh, the total all nice figure requirement is 2.5 db along with the iip3 of 11 dbm and the total receiver gain is 92 db so this chip we designed for one our system which will be for the satellite receiver so this follows this direct conversion architecture. So the front end is LNA. After that, there will be one IQ mixer. Then there will be this DC offset correction to make sure that the curling problem will be solved. And also we have programmable variable gains along with low pass filter. And finally, output will be given to the baseband. So this is the system what I'm talking. This we call this Anurag multimedia broadband receiver. This is the Amber receiver. So what in this system we have done, we have integrated the receiver which will take the video data from the satellite. And it's a very handheld system to integrated in the tablet basically. So it will receive the signal from the DZ6 satellite and it will display the video, some eight channel video. It's like kind of a one small portable video receiver. which will use for this for troops when they are in the field, they want to see some kind of maps or some kind of video messages. For that purpose, this has been used. So this, uh, this system has used this RFIC along with the some external uh, digital processing. So well, as we are talking that there will be one kind of RF systems. So in the RF system, uh, this is showing one architecture what we use in Umber. Basically, we use one along with uh, our RFIC, we used one FPGA for, the, uh, for digital signal processing along with ADC. And then uh, also we used uh, multiple kind of uh, interfaces to make sure the operation. So that also it will come in very small size of board and integrated inside the tablet. We have used this, uh, <laughs> this global foundry 130 nanometer uh, by CMOS process for design. So they have given us the information what kind of layer they have and what kind of uh, circuits we can implement. So with the help of this foundry PDK, we are able to integrate the multiple things in the single chip. So for designing this RFIC we have to understand all this kind of information from the PDA, what kind of metal layers are there and how many layers are there, what are the inductor we can design, what are the kind of capacitor we can design. So that information is required for all this designing of this kind of RFIC circuits. So basically this 130 nanometer, I'll just, we'll give, I'll just give brief on some, what kind of parameter required for designing this kind of circuits. Is that in this uh, technology, 130 nanometer, this is a twin well process with having 11 to 16 ohm substrate transition. And also the transistors are working at uh, 1.2 to 1.5 volt. And also the FT, what I told you that for this FT, the 200 to 260 gigahertz and with the, uh, breakdown voltage of 1.7 volt and also they have high breakdown FT which are uh, FT 57 to 75 gigahertz but the breakdown voltage will go to 3.5 to uh, 3.5 volt. So there are different information like how many metal layers they have different uh, with different thickness and the uh, what kind of inductors and how this millimeter waves can be fabricated. Okay, so the second application, what I'm talking is this AES radar. That's basically electronic steering array radar. So what happened here? So the basic in, basic uh, uh, basic of this kind of radar is basically instead of uh, rotating the radar, we will do uh, electric electro electronically will steer the array. So how that will have, be done? So basically in that circuit, there are multiple phase shifters and attenuators are there which will control the phase and amplitude of each component. So there are multiple, and this is kind of array, which is integrated in a single substrate. So, so that the information regarding each uh, phase and attenuation has to be transferred to this uh, array so that can be steered. So this is the architecture of our this, uh, AES radar. So what happened, the front end is a kind of power amplifier, SPDT switch and the switches are there. After that, there will be a combined uh, RFIC, which will, which will consist basically driver amplifier, low noise amplifier and SPDT switch. After that, we have one uh, component, uh, 
which will down convert this high frequency ka band into the low frequency s band then s band we are doing this renovation and phase shifting so the main challenge here is that uh, total width of this component should be less than 4 mm why because the in the ka band the antenna switch for each component having only 4 mm antenna so everything should be fitted in between that uh, that width actually so that the 4 mm is the challenge to design all the chips should be in the that range only and all the components should be in fit within this 4 mm range for this one so this is a one single array component so like that there some 2000 component will be sitting on a single board so i'll just go a little brief on the design uh, how we done the design for this kind of alien and uh, front end systems and uh, this rf i this uh, is a radar component so basically the uh, circuit what you are seeing is a kind of a lna so this is a basically cascode uh, architecture so we have two transistor you bgt we are seeing which have been cascoded along with the, some passive component l1 and c2 and, uh, and also the input matching which also has to be done so what are the components you are seeing there everything has been fabricated in a on chip actually so all this inductors and capacitor is sitting inside the R rf cmos ic chip so that there is a trade off between gain and noise figure so we have to do this appropriate transistor sizing what kind of transistor sizing has to be done so that uh, gain and noise figure will be so there is one design, design methodology we have to follow so make sure that uh, all kind of parameter what we are getting to so get the first way to get the optimum collector current uh, the density to satisfy the gain and the noise figure requirement for the intended application so we do some kind of simulation we are using some rfic simulated tools to get the information so what where we get the what is the optimized value of current where we can get the lowest noise figure and we can get the optimum gain so first we decide by i by this curve we are seeing that by changing the collector current the gain is reducing and first uh, noise is reducing then it is increasing so there will be one optimum collector current so here in this around uh, 1.9 milli ampere the noise figure is around 2.32 db and the uh, collector uh, and the gain we are getting 33.3 so this will be the optimum current we have to choose for our design then also we have to see the length of emitter because uh, in rf everything is depend on the matching so you have to follow this matching methodology so mostly take the matching uh, parameter and then we see that what point uh, we are getting this impedance matching so around the emitter length of 8 micrometer we are seeing that uh, there will be a matching of 50 ohms so that we chosen for our design so then there will be like cascading so the multiple equation for this inductance and capacitance has to be solved for this matching and along with the gain parameter so, so basically the transistor parameter we define a gm along with there are some internal capacitance like c pi and all these things are a kind of internal parameter and also with some inductor values so the equation has to be solved to get the optimum input input impedance along with the matching network so this figure shows the basically layout uh, how the that is actually schematic diagram this is actually physically how it will look like so this is a in input side is like a pad actually we call it the gsg pad so the blue blue the blue is along with the ground then we provide the bias then there will be le is a basically inductor so this structure what you are seeing is a kind of inductor so there are multiple inductors are integrated in a chip along with the supply and the there will be a punch we are seeing very small components so the transistors become very small component compared to the inductors So this is one arc. This is one inductor. Uh, one LNA has to be implemented. So this is this figure is showing the two the two stage LNA. What I am showing is schematic earlier. This so at the time of designing we have to properly. Okay, sir. Actually, sir, you can take Pradeep for five minutes more. Okay. so this is showing the complexity for when a small rf design basically we have to do all kind of grounding design and all this biasing and everything so okay this is showing the results of what we have done uh, measurement and uh, simulated so we are targeting some 20 db but we get better actually measurement also we are getting around 22 db gain 
and uh, what kind of uh, return loss and then and this noise figure so this done all the measurement for our this uh, uh, any other this work be presented in one conference also the results actually and also that other that uh, this architecture for driver implement also multiple the balloon everything has to be chip so that the complexity is pretty much uh, very high compared to this uh, simple gate design. to very the capacitors capacitor okay just to let the this is the architecture for switch the to making so because in uh, radar what happen at a time either we are transmitting or receiving so we have to switch very fast uh, to transmit to receive mode so that also is a very this is also a component and because the switching will happen at high frequency so it has to be we have to be carefully has to be designed so as i telling the basically design challenge in this mmic is are basically lambda and implement this when we are designing this uh, rf components a lot of substrate loss has happened so that has to be properly tuned to make sure our circuit is working second is grounding defect then also we have limited choice of interconnect structure due to the substrate loss then validity and accuracy of device model and also we have to do the em models for full substrate and everything that also is very challenging in this kind of uh, design and this is showing that another chip uh, which we had done for this phase sector and to nature so mostly if you have seen this purple component is all our inductors then in between that green green component that are all the transistors so basically so that we also we have designed and also the sizes we make so the four components that thing so and also this is satisfying this phase errors and amplitude errors and we done the different measurement now, along with the and all of we also integrated digital circuitry to choosing how the bit has to be selected how things that are such has been integrated in the chip so this is full chip it is showing which having the phase shifter speed this switch driver amplifier lna alternator and also the size you see that the size we are getting at 3 mm by 4 mm mostly that are results um, so this is giving one brief of one design what we have done for this r one uh, es radar so basically the conclusion what uh, we have done in anurag this is since it is a we have different experience like digital asics like processor dsp socs and all that so this uh, soc design we started in 2006 only Log in RFIC design. So that after that, we have done some ten to twelve chips for different kind of application. So now currently we are working for this AES radars and uh, other kind of systems for the missile missile systems, which will be directly going in the systems. And uh, that's uh, that's uh, we got the expertise on this mix signal IC and to cater for different uh, user requirements. What uh, that coming for the from the DRDO side. so we have a team of some uh, to 10 members so which uh, we, which were working on this field so i want to acknowledge uh, everyone for this efforts and uh, and thank you i want to thank you for the giving the opportunity to present our work here i am yeah. the limit otherwise we can discuss more on this yeah, yeah. thank you thank you pradeep saurabh Sir, there is a small question now, sorrow from me. Pradeep, Pradeep sir, when we are listening, technology is improving like anything nowadays. Okay, uh, DRDO, RCR, Andhra are doing wonderful jobs, and American people are doing wonderful jobs. Where we are uh, earning lakhs and crores of rupees through cyber uh, fraud, other things. Now, even in the age of 2022, there are two things still I am worried. even when technology is grown like anything where we are creating artificial uh, human beings and other things uh, even till today if a body is going to hit the flight is going to stop 
Correct. There is no <laughs> mechanism which I heard from uh, 1960. Uh, body came and uh, flight stopped. And another recent wonderful uh, thing I observed, America stopped flights because of the 5G technology. That means when the 5G technology is coming, America knows and when uh, in and around the airport, what are the uh, measures we are supposed to take? Uh, suddenly they stopped. If anybody leaves as if you are uninticated, all the flights are stopped. The simple reason is 5G. Why uh, America or anybody is not taking uh, some precautions uh, when you are doing wonders with RF signals and other things? Small question. Yes, doing a lot of experiment so what happened this frequencies now you see the frequencies are uh, people are using left and right but what happened uh, the two things sir if there are some system they are using in same band that also create problems suppose i am using one frequency in one band and the other people also using same band there will be a lot of interference will happen so the kind of scenario is happening. So what happened there, since uh, this 5G, what people is still in proposal, they are not uh, finalized everything, what kind of uh, frequency has to be used. They are targeting multiple frequency bands. Some people targeting in range of 28 to 30 gigahertz. Some people targeting at 60, 70 gigahertz. Some people talking that we will use in six to seven gigahertz only. So still there are a lot of debate is on this 5G, what band has to be used and which will be the optimum because who are defining this standard to understand all these problems. So still the problem is there because uh, this are first thing is high frequency and second is high power also. So they will try to interference with the other systems which already operating for the earlier they, this uh, frequency has been not used for communications. Now the people start using this for the communications. So that problem has to be solved by this community on C. So they have to define what band has to be used, what kind of power level has to be used. After that, only this 5G problem will be solved, sir. So that may be the issue due to all this uh, happening. Anyhow, people now able to do the circuit in a lot of things. Now people, we are targeting in frequency or circuits trying to operate at 110 gigahertz also. So frequency is now no limitation in the, you know, people trying to do some terahertz communication using this RFIC technologies. So that technology has no limitation, but that has to be standardized limitation has to be given what kind of frequency you have to use. That is the thing, sir. Hello? Hello? Hello, sir. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Saurav Roy and Pradeep Dixana, sir, for this accelerating talk. Now, I request Dr. D. Haranath, Associate Professor of Physics Department, to chair the next session and introduce our speaker, Ramakrishna Rama. Sir, please. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce my friend, uh, Mr. Ramakrishna Rama, who is the Senior Director, Compute Softwares, Toilet Packard Enterprise. Uh, so he is uh, not only my friend, he is also uh, MC Tech Instrumentation student from 1991 to 94 batch. First batch student, sir. First batch student. Am I correct, Ramakrishna, sir? You are the first batch student. That's right. I am the first batch student. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. And uh, not only alumnus of NIT Varangal, and uh, he has done uh, MBA. Yes. in 2006 to 7 and uh, in i am bangalore okay and uh, he's also a certified level 3 level, uh, 3 J australia usa before returning to india held multiple leadership positions at various levels with uh, global fortune 500 companies 
started professional journey with uh, BRC Mumbai as trainee, trainee engineer. Uh, and later worked with uh, Okogawa, uh, Tech Mahendra, Lucent, Motorola, uh, Redisys. And after that, uh, Dell as a director software uh, site lead uh, till October 2021. And currently, he's the senior director at uh, Hewlett Packard Enterprise. And he has uh, got 26 plus years of industry experience in leading R&D produce uh, engineering and software development for IT, cloud, uh, data center infrastructure systems, telecom, network systems, automotive, industrial control systems, and automation. And let technology organizations, end-to-end -end product development, and R&D design centers with strategy and execution, aligning with global business objectives, having a track record in establishing the culture of innovation, engineering, excellence, and operations management. And his expertise in embedded systems, hardware, software, product life cycle, building intelligent systems management products for enterprise servers, telecom network platforms, industrial automation, control and data acquisition systems such as SCADA, PLC, PCS, and auto automotive electronics. Have having led of a uh, blend of uh, open standards and custom design based computer uh, computing platform architectures experience including hands-on with proprietary uh, embedded systems and courts systems so he has uh, enormous experience in end-to-end -end engineering and design center operations and with this uh, brief uh, introduction, I invite yeah. Mr. Ram. Yeah. Uh, just, just I would like to add one more point, uh, Anna, sir. Sir. Uh, Mr. Ramakrishna Rama completed his dissertation work uh, under Professor Ram Gopal Reddy. That's why we requested him to deliver a lecture. That is the yes, only sir. one. It's Please go ahead, sir. Sir, I request uh, Dr. Ramakrishna Rama, Senior Director HP, to deliver a talk on Enterprise Digital Transformation software defined infrastructure sir you have about one hour time to speak about uh, this topic and followed by uh, five to ten minutes of discussion you may proceed sir thank you harnad and uh, thanks uh, dr dinakar and the entire uh, physics department of nid warangal actually it is an honor and privilege uh, for me on this occasion and as you mentioned, uh, Dr. L.R.G. Redigaru was uh, my internal guide uh, when I was doing my thesis work at Bark. And uh, not only that, uh, you know, we have a uh, lot of interaction uh, when I was in campus and when I left campus. So let me share my uh, presentation. Just a second. Okay. Are you able to see? No, right? Not yet. Uh, click the entire screen. Sir, present now button lock, Kandi. Entire screen. Uh, entire screen. And click, screen. click the screen. Click the screen. I mean that uh, box. First, first, you have to screen that picture and the entire screen. Oh, okay. Right. Now, now it is coming. Now it is visible. And Go please click that uh, hide button, sir. This button, yeah, at the bottom. Are you able button. to see now? Uh, yes, yes, yes. yes. Okay. It's fine. It's fine. Okay, so let me, uh, you know, give a little uh, my interaction with uh, Dr. L R G Redigaru. Uh, he taught us electronics uh, and microprocessors. And yesterday, I was looking at multiple messages on our uh, WhatsApp group. Many students were. Congratulating, uh, congratulating, sir, and uh, you know they were basically reminding and remembering about their uh, interaction and uh, sir's teaching. And just to say that uh, the same microprocessors what sir has taught, and also I think if I remember correctly, he also taught um, microprocessor-based instrumentation in fourth uh, semester. 
that was actually the specialization uh, for instrumentation. And even today, I am in the same microprocessor uh, domain, uh, dealing with uh, you know uh, electronics related software, embedded systems, and uh, you know overall system software. So that means we could we could build our career uh, for last 28 plus years with uh, with those teachings and what we learned in the campus. So that means in a way. Uh, SAR has played a significant role in our uh, shaping up our career. Not only me, uh, many other students as well. So just want to thank bottom of my heart uh, that, uh, uh, you know, SAR has uh, played a significant role and I wish him all the very best in the next innings. Uh, superannuation is just another milestone. Uh, everyone will go through it. Uh, but at the same time, it's an opportunity for uh, you know, next innings, whatever we would like to uh, do in our life, and uh, I wish him all the very best and very happy and healthy life in future. So, with that, uh, let me uh, proceed with my lecture. So, thanks for a nice introduction and kind words. Just to give a brief introduction about myself, uh, rest everything is covered. But personal side, you know, I love photography. I would like to travel. And of course, occasionally I cook, um, you know, different, different things and uh, interested in uh, reading books. And of course, uh, age is catching up. So obviously fitness is, uh, you know, another interesting area. Off late, I started doing, uh, you know, yoga, Surya Namaskar because of uh, pandemic when we could not go outside. Um, and family said, uh, wife and two children. My son is doing uh, final year uh, electronics and communication engineering. And daughter is in uh, 11th grade. That's about my family. Today, so uh, before uh, this session, um, you know, uh, Pradeep talked about uh, CMOS uh, and uh, you know, microelectronics design by CMOS and CMOS electronics design, uh, I will abstract a little higher. And uh, you know what actually all these electronics and wide variety of electronics and system on chips and microprocessors um, contributing and uh, in our day-to-day -day life and also in the business sense. Okay, that's what I would like to give a touch. Basically the enterprise software and the infrastructure. I will abstract one layer, I will not talk about the electronics, but I'll talk about the systems on top of electronics. And then the software, what role software is playing. So look at these, you know, we are all familiar. Just look at these as applications, right? You know, Google uh, as a browser or as an application, anything that you would like to search for information, you will use that. Facebook, I'm not talking about entire Facebook infrastructure. Just look at Facebook as an app, okay? Twitter as an app, LinkedIn as an app, and YouTube as an app, and simple, you know, Chrome as a browser, which is an app. But it is just an app uh, if you don't provide uh, infrastructure to process the data and information, the app will not give any useful information. So what requires underneath is your cloud infrastructure. These are all some of examples of cloud. Salesforce, AWS, Google Cloud, Azure, VMware, and HPE, we have GreenLake. So what cloud provides is a service as a software, and the service can be extended over internet as a HTTP uh, interface, and you will get those services. For example, Facebook. You know, whatever information your friends, you know, your family members, they are uploading their images, their information, their text. It resides in their cloud infrastructure. And what you get on mobile uh, device is an app which has access to the cloud through HTTP interface, and you will be able to get that information. And with that cloud infrastructure, anybody and everywhere from anywhere can post, can upload, can share the information, and it is managed at the cloud, 
and the front end through an app you are able to extract that instantaneously and that's where we are having digital world today i'm just trying to give an example uh, of uh, these use cases but you know you can extend that to any use case for example uber netflix uh, amazon all these you know uh, providing digital services um, using technology with these interfaces and with the back end cloud and uh, serving customers just to give uh, indian context based examples even if you have cloud but underneath you need to de- you need to deal with metadata for example if you are starting a bank in today's con- uh, context assume that you are starting a private bank what you need is you know any user comes with a new account opening you will have to verify through your banking systems connecting with national information center where our aadhar information is residing and authenticate user with uh, pan number aadhar information to confirm that he is the right user with right credentials and account can be provided and both these are happening the systems are talking to each other the government systems in this case national information center and your banking system talking to each other confirming the user is a right user with credentials comparing with other biometrics and uh, personal information and deciding immediately that the account can be provided okay and whether we know it or not those are already in place and uh, these are all benefits of uh, digital systems through digital interactions and another use case um, you know biometrics or um, even um, uh, dna analysis uh, even forensic sciences uh, now systems are talking analyzing um, you know uh, the information to confirm whether the person is the right person or not even in the uh, you know criminal investigations nowadays digital uh, forensic information is playing a vital role even as recent as our covid situation now we are all vaccinated but those vaccination has been approved on emergency basis typically the vaccination cycle is about 6 to 7 years to come to the market but we could Uh, make it happen within one one and a half years um, time frame how did it happen it happened through big data analytics where a lot of clinical analysis done on those samples using our high computing infrastructure and storage and because of that a lot of predictive analysis happened uh, and uh, based on that the vaccination approval uh, has been given otherwise typically it should be tested across multiple ethnicities uh, within human race and uh, across you know multiple continents and seven to eight uh, ethnicities uh, to be covered just to see what kind of uh, reaction response human beings go through these uh, vaccination samples and sometimes it could be short lived sometimes it could be long lived and again get the data then uh, apply analytics and then verify then you give an approval for these pharmaceutical companies to go ahead and bulk manufacture but all this with few samples we could uh, uh, fast forward we could uh, extrapolate uh, with big data and analytics everything happened through these digital systems so data science uh, you know today whether we directly or indirectly experience um, you know but data science is part and parcel of our lives uh, without data analysis without uh, data structure without applying algorithms and without processing the data without having those uh, programmatic tools and solving right problem in a right manner and not only solving keeping the repository of solutions so that tomorrow when there is a new problem you should be able to apply that instantaneously and be able to solve and also provide future prediction what could happen this is as simple as when you are trying to buy something on amazon the moment you log into amazon 
the web page which is shown on your personal device whether it is a mobile device or your personal computer or laptop the browser what it shows you is personalized display based on your interest what you have purchased in the past and what was your buying pattern in the last 3 months 6 months based on that it will predict your interest and it will it will show those items to you in the beginning unless you go and type and search then the next set of items will come in so same thing with google the moment you go to google it knows what kind of uh, you know uh, uh, what kind of websites they that you are searching and where you are if you are using google maps where you were going and it will try to show those things first based on your earlier pattern and try to personalize settings accordingly on the fly so all this happens knowingly unknowingly uh, based on our uh, our pattern based on analysis based on data uh, analysis and prediction and trying to solve specific problems and maintaining a repository of databases even simple netflix the moment you browse uh, certain uh, movies Uh, next time when you log in automatically those specific related whether it's action drama comedy those list of movies will pop up uh, as a preference so that means the intelligence is being built uh, at the device level so we call it as intelligence is being moved towards the edge not any more only with the data center or cloud um, or enterprise uh, it infrastructure it is being pushed more and more more and more towards edge devices because the devices are becoming more and more powerful and um, previous session we talked about 5g why there is much importance of 5g are we not able to make uh, for example phone calls are we not able to uh, watch movies on our smartphones today are we not able to increase bandwidth in 4g now that is not uh it is happening no issues but we would like to extend networking not only with consumer even enterprise that means if we have to connect anything and everything in tomorrow's world that means all physical entities campus like nad warangal make it as a digital entity right every asset physical asset if you want to convert as a digital asset uh for example power distribution we are talking about smart grid uh, smart city uh, smart campus smart agriculture everything smart that means people buildings cars vehicles animals land everything will become a digital asset through sensors and electronics and um, you know we need to process data take actions instantaneously using the data and push intelligence towards the edge wherever it matters so that uh, the world will uh, will operate autonomously efficiently and in a very well controlled manner uh, with more and more automation so that that's called cyber physical systems and the data analysis and data science become more and more important so now i will little talk about um, Uh, what is background uh, how do you process such a large amount of data now 5g will enable to to make everything and anything as a digital uh, information uh, center or a digital asset uh, but you should be able to process that you know the raw data to take meaningful decisions or to take meaningful actions or sometimes you will let systems take uh decisions to operate on its own right so why a lot of importance on 5g 5g using data science models and artificial intelligence and machine learning each network element whether it is radio network controller or base station or back end data processing or data switching uh, element everything will become autonomous they understand based on um based on user communication based on um based on packet switching across multiple elements of uh, 
5G network, and they will be able to distribute bandwidth on their own by intelligently talking to each other and adjusting their communication pattern accordingly within 5G network system. So that kind of intelligence is happening and uh, using the technologies of uh, machine learning and uh, artificial intelligence with cloud technology so that they are enabled with lots and lots of predictive analysis data so that a base station sitting remotely, for example, next to uh, NIT Warangal campus, if not, uh, not many users connected during off season when you know, campus is having vacation, no point in having that kind of bandwidth uh, allocated to a particular tower, right? It can give that allocated bandwidth to you know other towers where high, uh, you know, high communication is going on or high speed network is going on. Can they understand each other? Can they hand off to their uh, capacity accordingly? Can they share workload accordingly? All that can happen if they are intelligent enough. Uh, it's not that today they don't have, but you know, 5G is expected to leverage the current AI ML technologies enabled with cloud so that they become more intelligent. That means at the edge level, at the tower level, they become more intelligent and autonomous. I give another example of you know, how the physical entity is uh, kind of uh, uh, giving better solution uh, to create a positive impact uh, not only to users and also to improve their uh, business efficiency. Example of Asian Paints. It's a chemical company. It's a paint company. Um, you know, when I looked at their, you know, the, their business model almost uh, ten years ago, they used to have more than three thousand plus shades uh, they used to offer. But even today, when you go to uh, a small shop uh, in Warangal, uh, where they just opened. Uh, a front-end shop uh, where they sell paints. Uh, if you go and ask, they will give a cut catalog. You can select whatever paint that you want. Um, you know, you can just say, I like this paint, and each paint will have a code. And uh, the distributor or the reseller has been given a computer, which is uh, kind of funded by you know uh, Asian Paints. And he will enter the code in the computer. And his inventory will have only two uh, two shades, not two shades, two ingredients. One is white, the other one is a different uh, component. He will keep only those two boxes in his uh, shop, okay? And whatever you ask, whether it's a five liter, two liter, one liter, he will enter the code of paint, what you selected in the computer, and computer tells, depending on the quantity, what to mix, these two combinations, what to mix. And it will only mix. You just enter the code, put the box underneath, and put these basic two ingredients, and it will mix properly according to the algorithm which is developed by Asian Paints. And the respective shade, respective paint, will be poured into the tin and given it to you. It's a great business story. And uh, otherwise, the person would have kept uh, 3,000 plus uh, you know, shades of inventory. And we don't even know which customer buys what kind of shield and what quantity. And uh, it's uh, not easy for them to really manage, not just only at the reseller level, even their go downs to stock keeping to everything, even manufacturing, for example, based on the customer order, they have to manufacture respective uh, paint and they have to increase their raw material in the factory and things like that. But all that is solved with, with, uh, with their chemical research and combined that with the digital technology, with the help of computer, a person uh, can, uh, you know, uneducated person who opened a shop can just enter that code in the computer and computer does thing for them. What a, what a business model and what a technology, what a digital transformation. This is the best example of digital trans transformation. Before you look at Uber, Netflix and all that, you know, we have, we have seen enough examples, you know, Uber doesn't own any uh, fleet, but, you know, using technology, they can uh, provide you the cab service in a click of button, but, you know, but their IP is, you know, the backend cloud technology or data center uh, and uh, software with that, you know, they can provide service 
uh, same with Netflix. They don't uh, produce any movie, but they can stream any movie with their streaming technology and backend cloud technology. Similarly with Amazon, you don't need to buy a computer if you are starting, let's say your own enterprise. I mentioned a bank. If you are starting a bank, um, you know, should you buy uh, servers, multiple servers, and then build network, build storage, depending on how many subscribers you have, you know, you have to store their records, their accounts information and a number of things. Should you invest on IT infrastructure? If you, you know, if you're a startup, you don't need to invest in your IT infrastructure. You can simply go and uh, subscribe Amazon and ask what kind of computing power you want, what kind of storage power you want, and Amazon will provide that to you. And if it want, if you want, um, you know, to be isolated, because security and uh, you know data protection is is a concern, you can define those policies, and they will make that digital uh, infrastructure completely secured, isolated from other subscribers. And combine that with, uh, uh, you know, uh, augmented reality, virtual reality, you know, um, face recognition, voice recognition, speech recognition, and number of technologies that we have seen today, all that is possible because of uh, digital transformation. So let us look at uh, what is IT infrastructure. Okay, so with more and more digital devices at the edge, you know, CCTVs, your, you know, uh, manufacturing sites. Today, most of the manufacturing are transformed, uh, kind of, uh, you know, automated. They're all, uh, you know, digital assets. Even traditional power plants, you know, uh, they are all completely uh, controlled, monitored. Uh, using digital technologies within the campus, but also now they are connected to, uh, you know, their headquarters or external entities uh, through, you know, uh, internet or communication systems. So that means the entire manufacturing site uh, kind of treated as a digital asset from an external world. For example, today, let's take any, um, let's take, a, whether it's a private or uh, uh, public power plant, uh, as long as they are providing it to national grid, automatically we you know we will come to know uh, what is the capacity, what is per day production, um, using a click of a button uh, uh, with a simple browser, right? So that means you will be able to connect if you really want to know at the at the you know, at each and every equipment level, what is the performance, for example, turbine, boiler, generator, these three are primary equipment at any power plant. Remotely be able to look at what is the performance of boiler, what is the performance of turbine, what is the performance of, uh, uh, you know, uh, generator. Uh, they will be able to provide that access in a very secured, controlled way for their employees sitting in Delhi, for example, in national grid, if they want to really see what's happening in, let's say NTPC Ramagundam, they will be able to really look at in addition to the in addition to engineers at the plant, even remote um, within um, uh, power grid, be able to really look at what's happening. Okay. Similarly with autonomous cars, you know, it is expected in another three, four years, most of the most of the cities in most of the countries will have more and more autonomous cars on highways. That means cars will talk to each other, understand, adjust uh, based on their, uh, you know, intelligence and communication uh, to take decisions uh, while they are on uh, on drive. They are on uh, on the highway. Similarly, with uh, people, we we hold multiple devices. That means you know, even though we think uh, we are not saying anything to anybody but our information is being communicated through our handheld devices, irrespective of whether we enable or talk or share, but exactly our mobile is tracking where we are residing. Uh, all of you, if you are in different, different locations, or let's say if you are in NAD Warangal campus, your mobile will clearly say where you are located in NAD Warangal campus. That means irrespective of we say anything, 
our devices are talking about our whereabouts. So all this is happening through data. And data to be stored, data to be processed, and data to be analyzed. And that's, we call it a storage compute. And you also need to connect to cloud for specific um, you know, information, specific large applications to derive meaningful uh, information or to take uh, decisions uh, based on that or to expect systems to take decisions, right? For example, on um, the smartphone, it may, uh, it will keep tracking the nearest uh, radio network controller or base station or tower, sometimes due to whatever reason, if the signal is weak, immediately it will look at next optimal tower in the vicinity and try to connect to that to improve its signal strength. You are not asking or you, are, you, you haven't triggered anything, but you know it will keep doing it. That is the reason you are the number of bars on signal strength sometimes go up and down because at the background, it is trying to check what is the best alternative uh, signal strength that it can get. So all that to happen, uh, you know, you need IT infrastructure because handheld devices is just one device and uh, the infrastructure at the base stations, the infrastructure at the, you know, if you are an Airtel or, uh, you know, Tata, you need large scale infrastructure at their enterprise level uh, to manage such kind of uh, data. So this is what is happening. Uh, we talked about edge, you know, whatever is very close to the consumer or very close to the end device, we call it as edge. And again, it could be intelligent, non-intelligent devices. And core is something where you process that raw data and sometimes you build intelligence very close to the edge and uh, be able to take decisions then and there itself with the uh, core infrastructure. But most of the times you depend on large computing, large uh, processing to be done. And that's where you will build or you will have an interface with cloud where cloud, you know, cloud has thousands of servers and um, may have large amount of uh, data storing capability uh, and may may host uh, not may will host uh, large number of applications so that on the fly you can download uh, or you can subscribe uh, and you know uh, derive meaningful uh, you know actions or decisions so this is where you know core is nothing but kind of a small data center uh, positioned very close to the edge. Otherwise, your decision making or transaction will always depend on the on the cloud, and sometimes it may be consuming. So, this kind of architecture will provide intelligence moving towards edge. Earlier, you know, two tier architecture. It was more dependent on data center or central processing, uh, you know, and uh, that was time consuming. And now because of semiconductor technology where devices are capable of processing and when they have that kind of processing power and when you have a small servers or small data centers located very next to them, it will be easy to have certain local actions to be taken then and there itself and not to depend everything on the cloud. For large applications, you can depend on the cloud or large uh, repository, you can depend on the cloud. That's how the business models are changing. And I talk, I just mentioned about smart grid. For example, just look at smart grid. Your power plant is um, sophisticated and very efficient, but your power distribution is not sophisticated, then you will not gain much. And the concept of smart grid is uh, power production, which is automated and digitized. Of course, industrial automation has been there for the last uh, you know, 50, 60 years. Now, the IT automation and um, you know consumer level sophistication has happened. So assume 
each transformer substation is kind of digitized they will be able to understand and adjust and take automatic actions uh, through plcs and um, you know control systems employed there and even consumer side each appliance at our home for example our refrigerator our washing machines our um, air conditioners if they are smart enough today it is one way irrespective of whatever that you consume the electricity connection is provided whether it is um, uh, you know 4 kv at the substation level or at the domestic level whatever is the allotted uh, uh, power is allocated to you irrespective of whether you consume all of them or not but you will pay whatever you consume for example if i'm not switching on my washing machine all the time if i'm not switching on my refrigerator all the time if i'm not switching on my air conditioner all the time that means i will not be using that power and if there is an industrial area next to my area can that be provided to them and can my appliance a refrigerator can talk to the substation say that hey i'm not getting powered on whatever power consumption allocated to me or allocated to this house they will not consume all of that you can divert that power wherever it is needed within your substation so that means the transformer can be smart my appliance can be smart and with that overall you will achieve a smart grid then your power production can be smart it it can only produce whatever is really required by users right so that means it is not just only that you know energy efficiency carbon footprint and number of things but all that can happen with this digital technology and that's where the digital infrastructures are being built okay and the concept of operational technology and information technology operation technology is something at the let's say substation level power plant level that's called operation technology dedicated systems dedicated control systems dedicated industrial automation systems combine that with your information technology that is cloud um you know mobile application um database so all those things you know if they can talk to each other wonderful things can happen and uh, better decision making better energy efficient that's where the you know today's um, enterprise infrastructure systems are being built uh, and we are seeing more and more use cases and we are seeing more and more uh, applications so this is where the iot is you know again 5g to make it happen you need better communication across edge devices that means your sensors actuators connected that with gateways um, data acquisition systems otherwise today that is a bottleneck uh, either you depend on fiber optic and uh, it's again a kind of very tedious process uh, to have uh, you know uh, to lay down cables across any geographic uh, uh, location in a country uh, to go to remote places even though a lot of work has been done and being done but still that will become the bottleneck but with 5g uh, if our wireless systems have that kind of uh, communication bandwidth and capacity uh, it can do wonders and that is where the autonomous systems of uh, very sophisticated Uh, network elements of 5g is promising to provide uninterrupted bandwidth uh, without laying down the cables and uh, uh, and be able to provide a very optimized uh, solution uh, at the bottom if you really see the data always flows from uh, the actually raw data or metadata flows from uh, uh, edge to the uh, cloud and the control always happens earlier it used to be the bottleneck with uh, data center or cloud but now because of uh, core where it is capable of and we call it as edge it if you really see the third row uh, third column sorry third column is uh, edge it where it is a kind of a small cloud very close to the very close to the edge okay that means you know if i have to give an analogy uh, kind of you know next to a nid warangal campus there is a substation 
like uh, if substation if it is completely digitized let's say you know all substations with the plcs and um, uh, two three servers to capture the information of all transformers in and around nad warangal that substation will become edge it and then it can connect to uh, you know electricity board and uh, you know that will become electricity board will become data center in hyderabad and you will come to know what's happening at the substation level what is the power consumption uh, and you don't have to depend uh, this substation doesn't need to depend on electricity boards command and control all the time next uh, to make it happen uh, what you need is uh, such kind of systems so any data center or a cloud both are almost same from architecture point of view uh, cloud nothing but uh, it provides a uh, uh, kind of uh, multi tenant uh, services uh, data center is a kind of a private cloud but how you build a data center to host and process such kind of large information you need server to compute you need storage to store data and you need a network whether it's a network switch uh, sometimes router switch everything combined uh, in an enterprise level we call it as switch uh, you know layer 3 switch uh, that provides services over internet kind of a simple http request and you will get a response um, all that uh, happens through you know internet uh, services and you need network and if you are building uh, a data center uh, depending on the capacity capability uh, what level of services that you are building accordingly you will have to uh, you will have to design your data center with respective server for computing power with respect to storage you know how many io operations io operations input output operations that you need and what kind of uh, data protection that you uh, that you provide what kind of uh, data backup and restore that you need to provide and we call it as data availability and accordingly you will you will design your storage systems and and of course network so why i am bringing this earlier all this used to be kind of independent hardware driven software uh, kind of approach and today it is more of software driven uh, mechanism software driven architecture still hardware is there but hardware is abstracted in such a way that everything is operated at software level i will give a brief introduction about that so this will give you the sensors and at the you know at the back end data center underneath this thousands of uh, system on chips microprocessors um your network controllers storage controllers these are all embedded 